There could be multiple consciousnesses. Of course, one will not be aware of the other and possibly not even able to infer the agency, even if it was. We do not become conscious after the PhD. We become conscious before we can track a finger. So I suspect that consciousness allows the self-organization of information processing systems in nature. Yosha Bach and Carl Friston, today's theolocution guests, are known for their work in artificial intelligence, neuroscience, and philosophical inquiry. Bach, an AI researcher, delves into cognitive architectures and computational models of consciousness and psychology. Friston, a neuroscientist, is lauded for his development of the free energy principle, a theory explaining how biological systems maintain order. This framework of neural processes is rooted in thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. Yosha has been on this podcast several times, one solo, another with Ben Gortzo, another with John Verveke, another with Michael Levin, and one more with Donald Hoffman. Whereas Carl Friston has also been on several times, twice solo, another between Carl Friston and Michael Levin, and another with Carl and Anna Lemke. That one's coming up shortly. The first hour of today's talk is broadly on agreements so that we can establish some terms. The second hour roughly is on points of divergence, and the third is on more dark philosophical implications, as well as how to avoid existential turmoil precipitated by earnestly contending with these heavy ideas. For those of you who don't know, my name is Kurt Jaimungle, and there's this podcast here called Theories of Everything, where we investigate theories of everything from a physics perspective primarily as my background's in math and physics, but as well as I'm interested in the larger questions on reality, such as what is consciousness, what constitutes it, what gives rise to consciousness, what counts as an explanation. You could think of this channel as exploring those questions you, well, at least I sit and ponder at nighttime and daytime incessantly. Enjoy this theolocution with Yosha Bach and Carl Friston. All right, thank you all for coming on to the Theories of Everything podcast. What's new since the last time we spoke? Yosha, the last time was with Ben Gortzel, and Carl, the last time was at the Active Inference Institute. So, Yosha, please. Oh, there's so much happening in artificial intelligence. We have more on a weekend than a normal TV show has in seven seasons. <laughs> uh, so it's hard to say what's new. For me personally, um, I've uh, joined a small uh, company that is exploring an alternative to the Perceptron. I think that um, the way in which current neural networks work is very unlike our brain. And while I don't think that we have to imitate the brain, we have to figure out what kind of mathematics the brain is approximating. And we are trying to make headway with that. Great. And Carl? Uh, very similar, actually. Um, I guess what's new in the larger scheme of things, of course, is you know the advent of large language models and the um, all the machinations that surround that. And the uh, focus that that has caused in terms of, you know, what do we require of intelligent systems? What do we require of artificial intelligence? What's the next move to um, generalized artificial intelligence and the like? And um, so that's been certainly a focus of discussions, both in academia um, and in industry in terms of positioning ourselves for the next move and the implications it has, you know, both in terms of understanding the mechanics of belief updating and um, the move from the age of information to the age of intelligence, but also um, you know the, the philosophy and the principles. And interestingly, the conclusion uh, amongst me and my friends is exactly what Joshua articulated, which is a sort of more a more bi a commitment to a more, more biomimetic understanding of natural intelligence. Right. I read your paper, Mortal Computation, a Foundation for Biomimetic Intelligence. And well, we can get right into that, Carl. On page 15, you define what a mortal computation is as it relates to Markovian blankets. Can you please recount that? And further, you quote Kierkegaard, which says that life can only be understood backwards, but must be lived forwards. So how is that connected to this? Right. <laughs> You you are a voracious reader. That that was only put on archives a few days ago. I do my research, man. Um, and also, I did not write that. That was my friend uh, Alexander. You can take um, the credit. What? We'll remove this part. Uh, right. <laughs> no, I can't take the credit because I don't know about any of the philosophy. But I thought it was um, 
they're largely his ideas, but they resonate certainly again with this sort of notion of um, a commitment to biomimetic understanding of, of intelligence. Um, and that paper, that particular paper, sort of revisits the notion of mortal computation um, in terms of what does it mean to be a mortal computer, um, and the importance of the the physical instantiation, um, the you know the substrate on which the processing um, is implemented as being part of the computation in an in and of itself. So, um, you know that that speaks closely to all sorts of uh, issues. You know the um, the potential excitement about neuromorphic computing. Um, the if you're a computer scientist, the importance of in memory processing. Um, so you're technically you, you're trying to elude the Van Neumann bottleneck on the memory wall. Um, and I introduce that because that that is um, speaks to, from an academic point of view, the importance of efficiency in terms of what is good belief updating, what is good, you know, what is intelligent processing. Um, but from a more societal point of view, you know, the enormous drain on our resources incurred by data farms, by things like large language models in eating up energy and time and money um, in a very non-biometric way. So I think mortal computation as a notion, I, I, I think, has probably got a lot to say about um, debates in terms of direction of travel, um, certainly in artificial intelligence research. But you'll have to unpack the uh, the philosophical re re reference for me. So, Yosha, you also had a paper called A Path to Generative Artificial Selves with your co-author, Leanne Gabara, Gobora, sorry. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Toward the end of the paper, you had some criteria about selfhood, something called Max RAF, which has RAFs as a subset, and there were about six or seven criteria. Can you outline what you were trying to achieve with that, what RAF is, and what does personal style have to do with any of this? Uh, Leanne likes to express her ideas in context of autocatalytic networks. But if we talk to a general audience, I think uh, rather than trying to unpack uh, this particular uh, strain uh, of ideas and translate it into the way in which we normally think about these topics, I think it's easier to start from the, uh, directly from the bottom, from the way in which information processing systems in nature differ from those that we are currently building. In, on our GPUs, because the stuff that we build on our GPUs is designed from the outside in. We basically have a substrate with uh, well-defined properties. We design the substrate in such a way that it's fully deterministic, so it does exactly what we want it to do. And then we impose a function on it that is computing exactly what we want it to compute. And so we f design from scratch what that system uh, should be doing, but it's only working because the system is at some lower level already implementing all the necessary conditions for computation. And uh, we are implementing a functional approximator on it that does functional approximation to the best of our own understanding with a global function that is executed on this neural network architecture. And in uh, biology, this doesn't work. Also in social systems, these are all systems where you could say they are from the inside out. So basically, there are uh, local agents, cells, that have to impose structure on the environment. And at some point, they discover each other and start to collaborate with each other and replicate the shared structure. But before this happens, there's only chaos around them, that which they turn gradually into complexity. And so the intelligence that we find in nature is something that is growing from the inside out into a chaotic world, into an unknown world. And uh, this is a very different principle uh, that leads to different architectures. So when we think about an architecture that is growing from the inside out, it needs to be colonizing in a way, and it needs to impose an administration on its environment that basically uh, yields more resources, more energy um, than the um, maintenance of this administration costs. And it also needs to be able to defend itself against competing administrations that would want to do the same thing. So right, you are the set of principles that outcompetes all the other principles that could occupy your volume of space. And uh, the systems that do this basically need to have a very efficient organization, which at some point requires that they model themselves, that they become to some degree self-aware. And uh, I think that's why uh, from certain 
degree of complexity, the forms of organization that we find both in minds and in societies need to have self models. They have need to have models about what they are and how they relate to the world. And this is um, what I call sentience in the narrow sense. It's not the same thing as consciousness. Consciousness is uh, this real time um, perceptual awareness of the fact that we are perceiving things that creates our perceptual um, individual subjective now. But uh, sentience is something that I think can also be attained by, say, a large corporation that is able to model its own status, its uh, own existence in a legal and practical and procedural way. And that is training its constituents, the people who enact that agent, uh, in uh, following all the procedures that is necessary for keeping that sentient uh, larger system that is composed of them alive. And so when we try to identify principles that could be translated into nervous systems or into organisms consisting out of individual self-interested cells, uh, we see some similarities. We basically can talk about how uh, self-stabilizing um, agents emerge in self-organizing systems. So Carl... I know quite a slew was said. If you don't mind saying, what about what Yosha had spoken about coheres with your model, your research, or what contravenes it? No, I was just um, marveling how, how consilient it is. Yeah, using a lot of my favorite words there. <laughs> um, <laughs> it also reminds me of people like Mike Levin. You know, it'd be nice to hear. I don't know if Josh has had the chance to speak with Mike, but he, I, he would again, I think, fully endorse that perspective. Actually, Yosha has spoken to Michael Levin, and the link to that will be in the description. I've never heard the inside out. Uh, metaphor before, but um, I, I think that's absolutely right. It sort of chimes with Andy Clark's notion of um, sense making and sentience that it's a very constructive inside out process. It's not just trying to extract information from the sensorium. You're actually um, actively sampling and actively generating hypotheses for sensations. And crucially, you are in charge of the sensory data that you are, um, that you are making sense of, which speaks exactly to, I think, what Joshua was saying, uh, you know, in terms of, um, designing and orchestrating and creating an, an, an ecosystem in that, in that sort of inside out way. That, that, that sounds absolutely consistent with certainly the perspective on self-organization to non-equilibrium steady state um so talking about sort of stable sustainable kinds of self-organization again that you see in the real world and, and uh, are quintessentially biomimetic um th you know th that um if you wanted i think to articulate what we've just heard in the um from the point of view of a physicist who's studying um non -e non equilibrium steady states that's exactly the kind of thing that you get and this uh, you know even to the the you know the notion of the increasing complexity of a structural sort that requires this sort of consistent harmonious um ecosystem of exchange um that would be read, for example, as generalized synchrony or synchronization of chaos in dynamical systems theory. Another key point um, that uh, was brought to the table was this notion of um, uh, how essential it is to have a, a self model. Um, and uh, immediately I was reminded of, you know, the early move, uh, the early cybernetics movement and notions of the good regulator theorem from uh, Ross Ashby. But I think Josh has taken that slightly one step further than Ashby and his colleagues, uh, in the sense it is a model of self. And I think that's, that, that's an important move because, you know, you can have a good regulator, you can have a thermostat that, you know, arguably, or a what's governor that arguably has an implicit mortal computational model of its, um, of its world. But to be an agent, I think you have to have a model of you as an agent in that, in that ecosystem. Almost invariably, when I speak to both of you, the concept of self comes up. I think we could do a control F in the transcript and we'll see that it's orders of magnitude larger than the average amount of times that that word is mentioned. And I'm curious as to why. Well, in part, that's because of the channel, the nature of this channel. But is there something about the self that you all are trying to solve? Are you trying to understand what is the self? Are you trying to understand yourselves? Carl or Yosha, if you want to tackle that. Well, I, the problem of naturalizing the mind is arguably the most important remaining project of human philosophy. And it's 
risky and it's fascinating. And I think it was at the core of the movement when artificial intelligence was started. It's basically the same idea that uh, Leibniz and uh, Frege and Wittgenstein pursued. And uh, basically this idea of mathematizing the mind and the modern version of mathematics is constructive mathematics which is also known as computation and, and this allows us to make models of minds that we can actually test by re-implementing them it also allows us to at some point connect philosophy and mathematics which means that we will be able to say things in a language that is both so tight that it can be true and we can determine the truth of statements um, in a formal way and other, uh, on the other side, so deep and rich that we can talk about the actual reality that we experience and observe. And uh, to close this gap between philosophy and mathematics, we need to automate the mind because our human minds are too small for this. But we need to identify the principles that uh, are approximated in the workings of biological cells that model reality and then scale them up in the substrate that can scale up better than the biological um, computations in our own skulls and bodies. And um, this is one of the most interesting questions that exists. I believe it is the most interesting and most important question that exists. The uh, understanding of our uh, personal self and how this relates to our mind and how our mind is implemented in the world is an important part of this. And while it's uh, personally super fascinating, I guess also for many of the followers of your channel, it's quite programmatic in its name and direction. Um, this is to me almost incidental. I, on the other hand, I've noticed an absence of seriousness in a lot of neuroscientists and AI researchers who do not actually realize in their own work that when they think about the mind and mental processes and mental representations and so on, that they actually th think about their own existential condition and have to explain this and integrate this. So we have to account for who we are in this way. And if we actually care about who we are, we have to find models that allow us to talk about this in an extremely strict, formal and rational way. And our own culture has, I think, a big gap in its metaphysics and uh, ontology, which happened after we basically transcended the Christian society. We kicked out a lot of terms that existed in the Christian society to talk about mind, consciousness, uh, intentionality and so on because they seem to be superstitious, uh, overloaded with religious mythology and not tenable. And so in this uh, post-enlightenment world, we uh, don't have the right way to think about what consciousness and self and so on is. And part of the project of understanding the mind is to rebuild these foundations, not in any kind of mythological and superstitious way, but by building on our first principles thinking that we discovered in the last 200 years, and uh, then gradually build a terminology and language that allows us to uh, talk again about um, consciousness and mind and how we exist in the world. So for me, it's a very technical notion, the self. It's just uh, the model of an agent's interest in the universe that is maintained by uh, a system that also maintains a model of this universe. So my own self is um, basically a puppet that my mind maintains about what it would be like if there was a person that cared. And I perceive myself as the main character of that story, but I also notice that there is intelligence outside of this existing, coexisting with me in my own brain that is generating my emotions and generating my world model, my perception and so on, basically keeping the score and uh, all the pain and pleasure that I experience is generated by intelligent parts of my mind outside of my personal self. And uh, I can also get to a point where I transcend this distinction and realize that I am the one that has creates this. But this is not going to be a human eye, not a human personal self that realizes this, but a self-identification of the mind itself that is producing a model of reality and of the organism's interests in it. Well, Carl, what's left to be said? Well, he's just said it. <laughs> so I can see there's a pattern here. All right. I'll say what he just said in different words, um, if I can. Um, so yeah, I, I love this notion of, uh, using the word naturalization. I, I, you know, I, I think naturalizing things in terms of mathematics and possibly physics is exactly the right way to go. And it does remind me of, um, my friend Chris Fields' notion that our job is basically to remove any bright lines between physics, biology, psychology, and now, uh, philosophy. Uh, and I think, you know, mathematics is, is, is the right way to do that. Or at least, um, the formalist 
using the calculus that you get from mathematics or possibly category theory or whatever uh, that can be instantiated in silico or ideally in more in, in, a, in a you know in any um, um, uh, again coming back to mortal computation. So I think that's a really important point, and it does speak, I think, to a, a, you know, a broader agenda which was implicit in Josh's um, um, review, which is the ability to 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 share to to share a common ground, to share a generative model of us in a lived world, where that lived world contains other things like us. So um, the one one I think requisite for just existing in the shared world is actually having a shared model, and then that brings all sorts of interesting questions to the table about um, is my model of me the same kind of model that I am using of you? to explain you, to ascribe to you intentionality and to, uh, all those really important um, um, states of being, or at least hypotheses from the point of view of um, predictive processing uh, accounts, hypotheses that I am in this mental state and you are in that mental state. Uh, so I, th I think that was a really important um, thing to say, that we need to naturalize our understanding of the way that we work in our in, in our worlds. In relation to the importance of self, um, again, I'm just thinking from the point of view of um, a physicist that you you cannot get away from the self uh, if you just start at the very beginning of information theoretic treatments self information for example uh, you know that's where it all all starts for me certainly um, regarding uh, variational free energy as a variational bound on self information and then you talk about self organization um, talking uh, all the way through to um, the notion of self evidencing as Jacob of how we uh, would put it uh, at every point you are writing down uh, or naturalizing the notion of self at, uh, at many many different levels and indeed um you know if one generalizes that um you're almost specifying the central importance of thingness in the sense that um i am a thing and by virtue of saying I, uh, I am implying, inducing a certain self aspect to me as a thing. And, uh, you're, again, that, that's the starting point for certainly the, the free energy principles approach to this kind of self organization. I, um, I repeat, I think Josh is taking us one step further though, in terms of it's, you know, we can still be, we can have ecosystems of things. Um, but when those things now, um, start to have to or play the game of modeling whether you cause that or whether I cause that, that now brings to the table an important um, model of our world that there is a distinction between me and you. And as soon as you have this fundamental distinction, which of course would be something that uh, a newborn baby would have to spend, you know, if hours, possibly months, um, building and realizing that mum is separate from, from uh, the child uh, herself. So I think that's terribly important. One final thing, um, just to speak again to um, the importance of articulating your know, self-organization in terms of um, things like intentions and beliefs and stances. Um, I think that's also quite crucial. And what it means, if you want to naturalize it mathematically, you have to have a calculus of beliefs. So you're talking basically a, um, a formulation either in terms of information theory or probability theory where you're now reading the probabilist probabilistic uh, description of this universe and the way that we are part of that universe in terms of beliefs and starting to um, think about um, all of physics in terms of some kind of belief updating. Carl, you used the word shared model. Now, is that the same as shared narrative? Ever find yourself questioning reality and then you snap back to it, remembering that, hey, you have nothing planned for dinner? That's where HelloFresh comes in. They deliver pre-portioned, farm-fresh ingredients and sensational seasonal recipes right to my door. They have over 40 choices every week, which keeps me and my wife exploring new flavors. I did the pronto option. They've also got this quick and easy option that makes 15-minute meals. There's also options if you're vegetarian, if you only eat fish. 
Something that I love is that their deliveries show up right on time, which isn't something that I can say about other food delivery services. This punctuality is a huge deal for both myself and my wife. Plus, we love using HelloFresh as a way to bond. We cook together. It's super fun when it's all properly portioned out for you already. So are you still on the fence? Well, it's cheaper than grocery shopping and 25% less expensive than takeout. The cherry on top? Head to HelloFresh.com slash theories of everything free and use the code theories of everything free, all as one word, all as caps, no spaces, for a free breakfast for life. That's free breakfast, people. Don't forget, HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. Links in the description. Carl, you used the word shared model. Now, is that the same as shared narrative? Yes. Com- common ground, if you're, uh, you know, Tomas. So, um, yeah. Uh, I mean, I use it literally in the sense of a, um, a generative model that somebody in generative AI would understand the notion. So if we talk about self-model as a special kind of generative model that actually entertains um, the hypothesis that I am the cause of my sensations, and you know, Joshua took us through the myriad of sensations that I need to explain, then we're talking about um, self-models as part of my generative model where that includes this notion that I am the agent that is actually gathering the data that the generative wow. model is, is, is modeling. So the generative model um, is just a simple specification. Again, from the physics perspective, it's it's actually just a probabilistic description of the characteristic states of something, namely me, uh, you know, um, that can be then used to describe um, the kind of belief updating that this model would have to evince in order to uh, to exist when when embedded in in a particular in a particular universe. Other readings of a generative model would be exactly um, the common ground that we all share. Part of my generative model would be the way that I broadcast my um, my inference, my belief updating using language, for example. That requires a shared generative model about the relation, you know, the semiotics and the the kind of um, uh, way that I would articulate or broadcast uh, broadcast my beliefs. That generative model is a model of dynamics. It's a model not just of the state of the world, but the way that the the you know the transition dynamics, the trajectories, the paths. And I'm you, you know I'm using your word narrative just as a you for a certain kind of path through some uh, model state space. So if you and I share the same narratives in in the Mm -hmm. sense that we are both following the same conversation and the same uh, mutual understanding, we are sharing our beliefs through communication, then that is exactly what, what I meant. To for that to happen, we have to have the same kind of generative model. We have to speak the same language, and we have to um, construe things and infer things in, in exactly the same kind of way. I was I just wanted to slip in um, frames of reference and uh, uh, alignment Please. of frames of reference. That's another sort of way of looking at that kind of thing. Yeah, Yosha, is there anything there that you'd like to respond to? I suspect that what makes this project so difficult that call uh, call out that is that that our models of reality are necessarily coarse-grained. They don't describe the universe as it is in a way in which it can exist from the ground up, but they start from the vantage point of an observer that is sampling the universe at a low resolution, both temporal and spatial, and only very few dimensions. And with a model that is uh, built on a quite unreliable and indeterministic substrate. And uh, this puts limitations on what we can understand with our unaugmented mind. I uh, sometimes uh, joke that uh, the AGIs of the future will like to get drunk until the point where they can only model reality with 12 layers or so, and they have the same confusions as human physicists when trying to solve the puzzles that physics poses. And they might find this hilarious, because many of the questions that uh, have been stamping us during the last uh, 130 years since we have modern physics um, might be easy to uh, be able to resolve if our minds were just a little bit better. We seem to be uh, scraping at the boundary of our understanding for a long time. And now uh, we are, uh, I think, 
at the doorstep of new tools that can solve some puzzles that we cannot solve and then break them down to us uh, for us in a way that is accessible to us because they will be able to understand the way in uh, which we model the world. But until then, we basically work in overlapping realities. We uh, have different perspectives on the world and the more we dig down, the more subtle the differences between our models of reality become. And this also means that if you have any kind of complex issue, we tend not to be correct in groups. We tend to be only sometimes individually correct in modeling them. And we need to have a discourse um, between individual minds about what they observe and what they model. Because as soon as a larger group gets together and tries to vote about uh, how to understand a concept like variational free energy, uh, all the subtleties are going to be destroyed because not all of the members of the groups will be understanding what we're talking about, right? So they will replace uh, the more subtle understandings with a common ground that is not modeling reality uh, with the degree of resolution that would be necessary, or they're not able to break things down to first principles. And this uh, first principles understanding, I think, is an absolute prerequisite when we want to solve foundational questions. I sometimes doubt whether physics is super well equipped for doing this. Uh, when I was young, I thought physics is about describing a physical reality, right? The world that we are in at some level. And uh, now I see that physics is an art. It's the art of describing arbitrary systems using short algebraic equations. And the stuff that cannot be described with short algebraic equations yet, it's like chemistry, is ignored by physicists and less, uh, left to lesser minds. And only 8% of the uh, physicists uh, after their degree end up working in uh, physics in, in any traditional sense. The others work in process design and uh, finance and uh, healthcare and many, many other uh, areas where you can apply the art of modeling arbitrary systems using short algebraic equations. And whenever that doesn't work, right, physicists are not worth very much. I've seen physicists trying to write programs, and uh, they really, uh, many of them have this bias of trying to come up with algebra and geometry, uh, where uh, calculus would be much better, or where automata would be much better. And uh, nature doesn't care about this. Right? Nature is using whatever works and whatever can be discovered. And very often, that is close to the toolkit of uh, this intellectual tradition of the physicists. But it's, I think it's sometimes helpful to see that uh, all these intellectual traditions that uh, our civilization has built start out with some foundational questions and then congregate around a certain set of methods. And it can be helpful to just go to the outside of all these disciplines for a while and then move around between them and look at them and study their tools and uh, see what common ground and what differences we can discover. I was quite shocked when I learned that a number of machine learning algorithms had been discovered in the 80s and 90s by econometrists and were just ignored uh, in AI and had to be reinvented from scratch. And uh, uh -huh. so I suspect there is a lot of these things happening in our Tower of Babel that we are creating across sciences because our languages start to differ in subtle ways and sometimes fundamentally miss model reality or ignore it to the point where I think most living uh, neuroscientists are practically dualists. Right? They will not say it out loud because that's been frowned upon, but they don't actually see a way to break down uh, consciousness, mind and self into the self that would run on neurons. Or they don't even think about the causal structure in the same way as you would need to to get to this point. And uh, as a result, they believe that thinking about these concepts is fundamentally unscientific. It's outside of the pursuit of science, and they do this only in church on Sundays. Yeah. So what's the solution to this Tower of Babel? Of course, it's AI. The solution uh, to everything is AI. We basically need to build a system that can think better than us and help us with it. Okay, Carl, do you also see the problem similarly, and do you see the solution similarly? Um, I think I do. Well, a long since a nice biomimetic AI. <laughs> I love this notion. Of, I hope no physicists are watching. Uh, and also, <laughs> the only physicists I, that I know all want to do neuroscience or psychology, uh, as a, uh, in addition to uh, economics and healthcare, which is uh, which is all small particle physics. So it's either neuroscience or small particle physics. Um, and I, as I get older, I am increasingly compelled by arguments that I've read um, from very senior old uh, physicists that it, it's all about measurement, it's all about observation. And in a sense, all of physics is just one of these 
generative models um, that has this particular um, um, capacity to um, disseminate itself so that we do have this common language and this common ground. So, you know, just to reiterate uh, one of Joshua's points, you know, it, it is physics in and of itself is just another story uh, that we find particularly easy to share. Uh, but I do take the point that even within physics, there is this tendency to... Um, to uh, to become siloed with my kind of common ground as opposed to your kind of common ground. So I know this notion of the overlap. And I was just reflecting upon um, the veracity of that, even in my little world. Uh, you know, so the free energy principle is unashamedly um, committed to classical um, formulations of the universe in terms of random dynamical systems and Langevin equations. And that would horrify quantum physicists and quantum information theorists who just wouldn't think about that. They, you know, again, I can't, that's why I slipped in that reference to, um, reference frames earlier on, because what we're talking about now is the alignment of quantum frames of reference. Um, but that uses a completely different language. Um, and, that I think is, you know, part of the problem that Josh has bring to bring to the fore. That what we need is something that's superordinate that joins the dots, uh, you know, and may well require transcending the particular common ground or physics or calculus or philosophies um, that have that, that have endured. So, if by that, the, um, artificial intelligence is going to be um, one way of. Uh, Joining the dots um, so that people in machine learning don't have to reinvent the wheel every uh, you know, every generation, um, then I think he's absolutely right. Whether I call that artificial intelligence or not, I, I'm not so sure. I, I think uh -huh. it would start to become part of part of a grander ecosystem that would have a natural aspect to it. But perhaps that. But, but, but perhaps I could ask you, Josh, do you actually mean artificial intelligence um, in the sense that it doesn't have um, a mortal or a biological aspect to it? Or do you just think something that goes beyond our um, our own sense-making and self-modelling as individual scientists or people? Uh, maybe I don't understand your notions of mortality and biology completely. To me, biology means that the system is made of cells, of biological cells, of cells that are built on a carbon uh, a cycle foundation on uh, certain chemical reactions that nature has discovered and translated into uh, machines uh, made from individual molecules that interact in very specific ways. And uh, it's the only agent that we have discovered to occur in nature, I think. And all the other agents we discover are made by or of cells. And uh, mortality is an aspect of the way in which multicellular systems adapt to changing environments. They have offspring that mutates and then gets selected against. And as a result, we have a, a change trajectory that can be calibrated to the rate of change in an ecosystem. And uh, this is one of the reasons for mortality. Another reason for mortality is if you set up a system that uh, has uh, suboptimal self-stabilization, it is going to deviate from its course. Like imagine you build uh, an institution like the FDA and you set it up to uh, serve certain purposes in society after a few generations, the people within that organization to a very large degree start serving the interests of the organization and the interests that have captured the organization. And so it becomes uh, not only larger and more expensive, but it's at some point it's possibly doing more harm than good. That doesn't mean that we don't need an FDA, but it might mean that we have to make the FDA model so it gets reborn uh, every now and then and can uh, put itself back on track based on a specification that outside observers think is reasonable rather than a specification that needs to be negotiated with the existing stakeholders within that organization and the few people who are left outside. And uh, I think this uh, is one of the most important aspects of mortality. But imagine that all of Earth would be colonized by a single agent, something that is able to persist not only across organisms, but it's also able to, to think using other, all other molecules that can be turned into computational systems and uh, into representational architectures and agentic architectures. 
you have a planet that is similar to Stanislav Lem's Solaris, right? It's a thinking system that is realizing what it is, that realizes that it's basically a thinking planet that is uh, trying to defeat entropy for as long as possible. And uh, to, uh, this end builds complexity. Why would that system need to be mortal? And would that system still be biological? It would be self-organizing. It would be dynamic. It would be threatened with death, with non-existence. It would react to this in some way. But I'm not sure if biology and um, mortality are the right categories to describe it. I think these are more narrow categories that apply to biological organisms in the present setting of the world. I had picked up on a phrase you said, Carl, which is one of the solutions may be AI. That's what you were saying in response to Yosha's, which makes me think, had Yosha not mentioned AI as the resolution to the indecipherability across discipline boundaries, what would you have said a solution or the solution would be? Um, well, I think the solution actually lies in, in what Joshua was, ju was just saying, um, in the sense that, you know, if the, the self-understanding is seen in the context of exchange with others um and that pr provides the right kind of context i think we're talking I, I, i've used the word a lot now but i'm talking about an ecosystem at, at any arbitrary scale um and an ecosystem that provides that uh, opportunity um for self-evidencing say to use use um jacob howard's um phrase that just is a statement that you've got uh, an itinerant open kind of self-organization that maintains this um, minimum entropy state in exactly the same way that uh, Joshua was intimating. So, you know, that would be, um, I'm, so I'm just thinking about sort of, you know, what is implied in this conversation by mortal computation um, and mortality in the context of things that die. Um, I do actually think that the, 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 we're they are being used in exactly the same sense and used in the sense that is, that is um, an inevitable aspect of self-organizing systems that will endure over time in the sense of minimizing um, the entropy of the states that they they occupy. And I do think that is the solution, which is why I was pushing back against artificial intelligence. But for a particular reason, um, the way that its um, mortal computation is um, framed, um, certainly in, the, in that paper, paper on which I was the second author, <clears throat> is that immortal computers um are built around software so they are immortal in the sense you can rerun the same program on any hardware <clears throat> if the running of the software and the processing that ensues is an integral part of the hardware on which it um, is run then it becomes mortal and that's important because the opportunity for dying if you are mortal now creates the kind of, if you like, selective pressure from an evolutionary perspective of exactly the kind that Joshua was talking about. That, you know, if you don't have the opportunity to die, if you don't have the opportunity to dissemble the FDA because it's no longer fit for purpose, um, then you will not have a sustainable self-organization that m continually maintains um, a low entropy in the sense that it has some characteristic recognizable states. So I think there is a deep connection between um, self-organization that we see um, in biological, social, um, possibly meteorological systems and a certain kind of mortality in which, um, for example, information about the kind of environment that I am fit to survive and to learn about is part of my gen uh, genomic structure. But to realize that, um, if you like, evidence accumulation through evolutionary mechanisms, I have to have a life cycle. I have to have, I have to die. Uh, and I'm not talking, um, you know, I'm not implying that we all everybody has to die in order to live i i'm implying that there has to be there has to be some particular kind of dynamics there has to be a life cycle it could be an economic life, life cycle it could be boom and bust for example but that has to be part 
of this self-evidencing and certainly an exchange in the kind of multicellular um, context that Joshua was was mentioning. So by mortal, I just mean, um, oh, my reading of mortal in this particular conversation would be, say, yes, it is the kind of biological behavior that is characteristic of cells that self-assemble but also die um, you know, one uh, um, attractive metaphor that came to mind when talking about the FDA becoming too, an organization becoming too big for its own good and not being um, a good model of the system in which it is immersed, so it's not meeting customers' needs, it's not even meeting its own needs, would be a tumor. So, you know, you could, you could, you could understand a lot of the institutional pathologies and geopolitical pathologies, uh, possibly even climate change, possibly even, um, uh, the current, um, um, uh, excitement about what's going to happen to open AI, you could, or so mm -hmm. your big tech. All of this can, I think, be read in terms of a process of mortal computation at a certain scale. Where there are, there is an opportunity for things to go away, to, to, to dissolve. That has to be the case in the same way that either the tumor kills you or it necroses because it kills off its own blood supply. It can't be any other way, really. There isn't a third way. Uh, you can evolve an immune response against tumors. If you are an organism that uh, lives to be much longer because it has slower generational change, they typically have better defenses against tumors than the shorter-lived organisms like us. And basically, a tumor can be seen as a set of tissues or a subset of agents. Like You can, in principle, have a tumor in an ant colony that is playing a shorter um, game than the organism itself and the larger system itself. And yeah. uh, uh, you can uh, sustain a number of tumors if your environment uh, does not put too much pressure on you. But at some point, the tumors are going to bring you down. And so, for instance, I think that uh, the free world has to make at some point a decision of whether it is accepting to be brought down and replaced by a different type of social order or whether it's going to evolve uh, or build or construct or design an immune response against tumors and criteria to identify them and remove them. And I, I think that's not a natural law. At least I don't see uh, how to prove from first principles that we cannot overcome a problem like uh, institutional uh, calcification and uh, or um, turning of institutions into tumor-like structures functionally. I think it, it might be possible to do that. The cell itself is not mortal. Right? The cell is pretty much immortal. The cell is individual cells can die and uh disappear but the cell itself is still the first cell it's just splitting and splitting and uh, it's alive in all of us every cell in our own body is still this first cell just split off from it right and uh, so the way in which organisms die and so on is just a detail in this larger project of the cell which itself is so far immortal And uh, when I talk about AI being the solution to everything, of course, I'm joking a little bit. I'm just uh, echoing some of the sentiment and uh, part of the enthusiastic culture of my young field. But uh, I, I'm only joking a little bit uh, because I think that AI has the potential to um, reverse engineer the general principles of a learning agent of a system that is able to uh, model the future and regulate for the future and uh, make uh, uh, functions in an arbitrary way. And I would replace the notion of the hardware, the substrate. Of course, it's still hardware, but uh, it can be an arbitrary substrate. And it, the substrate can also be, to a large degree, software, which means causal principles that are implemented uh, ultimately on physics. But uh, this causal structure ultimately is a protocol layer that allows you to um, basically implement a like representational language in which an agent can realize itself as a causal structure. And I think that AI is working currently on very different substrates than the biological ones. But uh, the, there is a superset of these principles that can um, make AI substrate agnostic. I think that the implication of the church Schubing thesis is that it doesn't really matter which hardware you're using. In practice, it does matter because uh, if a hardware is not very deterministic or it doesn't give you a lot of memory uh, or is very slow, you will notice big differences. 
but uh, if you abstract this away, the representational power and uh, the potential for agency is not really dependent on your hardware. It turns out that the hardware that we're currently using for AI is much, much more powerful than the hardware that biology is using. The reason why AI is so weak compared to uh, human minds or biological systems is because the algorithms that we have discovered, we have discovered them by hand. These were people tinkering. Sorry, what do you mean that AI is weak? I mean that uh, in order to get a system that is almost coherent, we need to train it with the entire internet, with almost everything that humans have ever written. And uh, as a result, we get a system that is uh, using tremendously more resources than a human uh, brain has at their disposal. I'm not talking about the computational power that is implemented in an individual cell that might be very large, but the part of the power of the individual cell that is actually harnessable by the brain for performing computation. That is very little. It's only a small fraction of what the neuron is doing to do its own maintenance, housekeeping, metabolism, communication with neighbors that is actually available for building uh, computation at the brain level. As an example, I sometimes use this, um, the stable diffusion rights when they came out. Stability AI is an AI company that makes open source models and they made a vision model by training um, uh, with GPUs on uh, hundreds of millions of images and text drawn from the internet and cross-correlating them until you can type in a phrase and then get a picture that depicts uh, that phrase. It's amazing that this works at all. It requires enormous computational power because it's far less inefficient uh, compared to a human brain that is learning how to draw pictures after seeing things. And these weights, this neural network, they know everything. They basically, they know um, um how to draw all the celebrities and how to draw all artistic styles and all the plans and um, everything is in there. And it's just two gigabytes. You can download it. It's only two gigabytes. And it's like 80% of what your brain is doing is captured in these two gigabytes. And it's so much more than what a human brain could reproduce. Right? right. It's absolutely brute forcing it. At the other time, uh, two gigabytes doesn't seem to be a lot. Right, which suggests that our, our own brain is probably not storing eff uh, effectively much more information than a few gigabytes. Uh, that's very humbling. And the reason why we can do so much more with it and so much faster than the AI is not because uh, biological cells are so much more efficient than transistors. It is because they are self-organizing and have uh, been at this game for quite some time and figured out a number of tricks that human engineers couldn't figure out so far. Right. Carl. Do you want to expand on points of contention and the mortality and perhaps permanence of a cell? Um, well, there's so many, again, so many issues. Um, <laughs> I hope we get to the differences now. <laughs> uh, well, no, we, yeah, we could, we could. But, there, um, but I, I just wanted to just celebrate this notion that, you know, the cell in a sense, is immortal because, of course, the whole point of this is to try and understand systems that endure over long periods of time. Um, and that's what I meant. Well, I didn't mean that death meant cessation. I just meant there's a certain life cycle and itinancy in play. Um, so you know, I thought that was nicely illustrated by the notion that the cell is, in a sense, unending. Um, but, but the mortal immortality is more about um, d divorcing the software from the substrate. Um, and there's a bit of a pushback then if we want to look for differences um, in, in the respective um, arguments. Um, then a lot of people would say that all that housekeeping that goes on in terms of intracellular machinations and self-organization, that just is basal computation at a particular level. Um, and it's, and that more macroscopic kinds of belief updating and processing and computation supervene at a certain scale. And indeed that progression, um, in a sort of scale invariant sense is, um, it is one manifestation of what you were talking about before that things biological things are cells of cells of cells of cells and have increasingly higher kinds of scales and different kinds of computation but the idea that the first principles apply it every and each level and it's the same principle at every and, and at each level and if you pursue that one has to ask why modern ai or particularly machine learning is so inefficient dangerously inefficient 
Uh, and, um, you know, there's, I think, a first principle account of that. And, and the uh, account would, um, go along the following lines that the only objective function that you need to explain existence is a likelihood of you being, um, your marginal likelihood. That statistically is the model evidence. The model evidence or the log of that evidence can always be written down as accuracy minus complexity. Therefore, to exist is to minimize complexity. Why is that important? Well, first of all, it means that that course grading that we were talking about earlier on is not a constraint. It is actually part of an ex existential imperative to course grade in the right kind of way. The other reason it's important is that there is a thermodynamic link between the complexity scored in terms of belief updating or processing or computation and the thermodynamic cost. And if that's the case, it explains why um, the direction of travel in terms of your know, machine learning is so inefficient um, and what it tells you is that there is a lower limit on the right way to do things there is a lower limit on the thermodynamic efficiency and the information computational efficiency specified by the landauer limit why um why does modern um or current machine learning not get anywhere close to that landauer limit um you know possibly two, three, four, if not six orders of magnitude living above it, whereas the brain is actually much, much closer to, the, to that to um, uh, that lower limit in terms of the efficiency, both, I repeat, thermodynamic and information theoretic kinds of efficiency. And the answer is, I think, the von Neumann bottleneck. It is the memory wall. It is that people are trying to do computation in an immortal sense by running software without careful consideration of the substrate on which they're, um, they're running or implementing that computation. So I would push back against the notion that it is even going to be possible, uh, irrespective of when it's the right direction of travel in terms of um, artificial intelligence research or indeed computer science research, I would push, push back against the notion that artificial intelligence read as a running of some immortal software on a Van Neumann architecture is the solution. I think the solution has to be more biomimetic, by which I mean it has to actually run on a substrate. It doesn't have to be um, a biological cell, but certainly has to conform to the same principles of multi-scale self-organization of the most efficient sort. That just is the optimization of the marginal likelihood or the self, the, uh, the evidence for the states that that particular computing device or computer uh, wants to be in. So that's what I, I had a slight sort of uh, hesitation about ag agreeing that, 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 that about the promise and potency of artificial intelligence. I don't think that's the right way to go about it. I, I, I would actually come back to your very initial, initial argument, Joshua, that uh, it has to be much more biologically inspired. It has to be much more biomimetic. And part of that sort of inspiration is the motivation for looking at the distinction between immortal running of running of immortal software on Van Neumann architectures, on NVIDIA chips, um, relative to a much more biomimetic approach, say photonics or um, neuromorphic computing. I think that really does matter in terms of getting uh, us to a situation, you know, getting uh, you, uh, Kurt described as a solution. I'm not sure there is a solution. There's a solution to the differential equations that has a, uh, a well-defined objective function in my world, uh, but certainly getting useful artificial intelligence in the same spirit that the FDA is fit for purpose and doing a useful job. Okay, let me push back against this. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, uh, I do agree that current AI is brutalist in the sense that it is not making the best use of the available substrates and it's not building the best possible substrates. We have a number of path effects. It's not that the stuff that uh, uh, we are building and using is not clever or so, but it's a far cry from what biology seems to have discovered. At the same time, there is relatively little funding going into AI and there's relatively little energy consumption given what it gives you. If you uh, if 
if uh, academics hear that it costs $20 million to train a model, they uh, almost faint because they compare this with their departmental budget. But if you would compare this with the cost of making half a decent AI movie in Hollywood, it's negligible, right? So basically what goes into an AI project is far less than what goes into a, a Hollywood movie about AI. And uh, if, if you compare this at the scale, right, if you look at societal benefit of watching an AI movie or watching another blockbuster uh, about the Titanic or so, it's not now, but it's. Uh, I think that AI has the potential to be dramatically more valuable than this. And uh, so I think that AI, even though it might sound counterintuitive, is not using a lot of energy and it's uh, not very well funded at the moment still compared to what it uh, what the value of it is. Also, the uh, leading labs do not believe that the transformer is going to be the ar uh, architecture that we have in the end. It just happens to be one of the very few things that currently works at scale that we have discovered that can actually be scaled up in this brutalist way. And it's already better at... Um, completing prompts than uh, the average person. And it's even better than writing code than many people. Uh, so it can translate between programming languages. It can, uh, you can write an algorithm down in English and uh, or it can even help you to write down an algorithm down in English and then translate it in the programming language of your choice. And it's pretty good at it. It can also, if it makes a mistake and it often makes mistakes, understand the compiler messages and then uh, try to suggest fixes that often work. In many ways, I've found that it's already better than a lot of people I've worked with in uh, corporate contexts, both at writing press releases and at writing code. It's not as good as the top uh, level people in their field, but uh, it's quite surprising. And so there is this interesting, open and tantalizing question. Can we scale this up by using slightly better loss function, by using slightly more compute, slightly more and better curated data? And uh, the systems can help with curating data and coming up with different architectures and so on to get this thing to be better at AI research than people. If that gets better at AI research than people, then we can leave the rest to it and go to the beach. And it will come up with architectures and solutions that are much more efficient than what we have come up with. At the same time, there are many uh, labs and teams that work on different hardware, that work on different algorithms at the same time. The fact that you see so much news about the transformer at this point is is not so much because everybody ignores it and doesn't work on it anymore It's uh, or has religious beliefs in the transformer being the only good thing. It's because it's the thing that currently works so well. And, and people are trying to work on all the other things, but uh, the thing that has the most uh, economic impact and the most utility happens to be the stuff that currently works. And so uh, this made cloud our perception that we think it's the von Neumann architecture and so on. But in some sense, the GPU is no longer a von Neumann architecture. It is uh, built, we have um, many pipelines that work in parallel that take in uh, smaller chunks of memory that are close, more closely located to the local processor. And while it's not in the, built in the same way as the brain, where all the memory is directly inside of the cell or its immediate vicinity, uh, it is much closer to it. And it's able to emulate this. And if I look at the leading neuromorphic architectures, I can emulate them on a the CPU and it's, it's not slower. This is all just research stuff uh, that is early stage. Uh, but we are not emulating neuromorphic architectures on a CPU for the most part, which is... Uh, GPU? As, uh, or no, GPU, which is largely because it doesn't give us that many benefits over the existing architectures and libraries. Or uh, the existing architectures and libraries work so well that people use this stuff for now and it creates a local bubble until somebody builds a new stack that is uh, overtaking it. And I think this is all going to happen at some point. So I'm, I'm not that pessimistic about the, these um, effects. What I can see is that our computers can read text at a rate that is uh, impossible for human beings when you parse the data into a large language model for training it. And it's in some sense a radically Fistonian program next token prediction, right? It's uh, really trying to predict the future and minimize its surprise. That's the core of this algorithm. Uh, with this paradigm, it gets to be coherent in the limit. It leads gets an interesting question. Maybe this paradigm is not correct. Maybe humans are doing something different. Maybe humans are maximizing uh, coherence or consistency. And we have a slightly different formal definition. And life on Earth uh, or agency in the universe might be minimizing free energy in the limit. 
but individual organisms are not able to figure that out. And they do something that is only approximating it, uh, but locally works much better and converges much faster. So maybe there are different loss functions that we have to yet to discover that are more biological or more similar to a biological systems. But it, also, one of the issues with biomimetic things is it is, means mostly um, mimicking the things that uh, scientists in biology and neuroscience have discovered so far. And this stuff all doesn't work. And the reason why Mike Levin doesn't call himself a neuroscientist, I suspect, but a synthetic biologist, is that he doesn't want uh, to get in conflict with the dogmatic approaches of some neuroscience, which believes that computation stops at the neurons. It's only neurons that are involved in computing things. It could be when you look at brains that they are basically telegraph networks of an organism, that the neuron is a telegraph cell. It's not unique in its ability to perform computation. It's only unique in its ability to send the results of computation using some kind of Morse code over long distances in the organism. And when you want to understand how organisms compute and you only look at neurons, it might be looking at uh, the economy about uh, 1900 and uh, trying to understand it by only modeling the telegraph network. Right? You're going to learn fascinating things by looking at an economy, looking at its telegraph network and looking at the Morse code, but thinking that communication can only happen in this Morse code rather than sending RNA molecules to your neighbors. Right? Why would you want to send spike trains if you can send strings? Why uh, would you want uh, to perform such computations uh, in a slow, awkward way? Why would you want to translate information into the time domain if you can send it in parallel all at once? So when we talk about biomimetic, we often talk about emulating things that we only partially understand and that don't actually work in a simulation. There is no working connectome right now that you can turn into a, a computer simulation and that actually does what it's doing. And it's not because computers don't have the power to run uh, the ideas that neuroscientists have developed, but neuroscientists don't have developed ideas that actually work. It's not that uh, neuroscientists are stupid or their ideas are not promising. They're just incomplete at this point. We don't have complete models of brains that uh, would work in AI. And the reason why AI has to reinvent things from scratch is because it takes an engineering perspective. It thinks about what would nature have to do in order to approximate this kind of function? And what's the most straightforward way to implement this and test this theory? And this is this experimental engineering perspective that I suspect we might also need in neuroscience. Not in the sense that we translate things into von Neumann architecture in neuroscience, but in the sense that we think uh, about what would nature have to do in order to implement the necessary mathematics to model reality. All right, neuroscientist, <laughs> your turn. <laughs> well, I hope no neuroscientists are watching this. <laughs> we, we managed to offend physicists and neuroscientists. <laughs> um, no, I, I mean, I, I largely I, I agree entirely with uh, many of those things. Uh, I'm just trying to remember uh, the, the ones that uh, I can argue with. Uh, I love this notion that it, there's more money going into uh, Hollywood films about AI than actually AI research. I've never heard that before. Mm. It's, that's marvellous. Um, and also the point about sort of GPU um, I mean, I think that's just a reflection of the, the um, if you like, natural selection in the AI community of what I was trying to say before about um, the, 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 uh, the, the, the move away from von Neumann architectures to more mortal computing. I mean, if you talk to people doing in-memory processing or P, uh, processing in-memory as computer science, I mean, you know, that, that's where they, we, we, they'd like everybody to be. And that's what I meant really by, um, uh, that aspect of mortal computing, that the, the, the infrastructure and the buses and the message passing, uh, having everything local, um, is, you know, speaking to the, the hardware implementation. So that, that, it, you know, I, I agree entirely that, that, that is, um, the direction of travel. Um, and I didn't want to imply that, um, <clears throat> Sort of uh, GPUs were, were 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 the wrong wrong way of doing it. Also, I agree. I mean, I, I wasn't really referring to uh, transformer architectures, um, and as you say, they're just um, you know highly expressive, very beautiful um, Bayesian filters, uh, you know, and um, and are now currently being understood as such. Uh, as my friend Chris Buckley would say, people are starting now to Bayes explain how a transformer works. Um, so. What would I disagree with? Um, well, perhaps to, to, um, I noticed that you on a number of occasions were trying to identify 
the universal objective function, uh, doing things better, uh, it being really good because it could translate lots of languages, having greater utility. Um, what do you, do, do you generally think that there is some magic utility function out there that has yet to be discovered? And do you think that AI is going to discover that magic utility function? And will that be the answer? Um, well, I think that ultimately utility relates to what makes the system stable and self-sustaining. So if you look at any kind of agent, it depends on what conditions can stabilize that agent. And uh, this comes down to very much the way in which you model reality, I think. Right? So it is about minimizing free energy in a way. But if you look at the, um, the uh, our own lives, and we look for a sandwich or for love or for a relationship or uh, for having the right partner to have children with and so on. We're not thinking very much about minimizing free energy. And uh, we perform very local functions because we are only partial agents in a much larger system that you could understand as the project of the cell or as the project of building complexity to uh, survive against uh, the increasing entropy in the universe. And so basically we need to find sources of like entropy and exploit them in a way that um, we can. And this depends on the agent that we currently are. And this narrows down uh, this broader notion of the search for free energy into um, more practical and applicable and narrow things that can deviate locally very much from this pure, beautiful idea. Uh, with respect to principle that should be discovered or has to be discovered and might be discovered in the context of AI, I suspect that uh, self-organizing systems need different algorithms than uh, the GPUs that we're currently using for learning because we cannot impose this uh, global structure on them. So uh, I suspect that there is a training algorithm that nature has discovered that is in plain sight and that we typically don't look at, and that's consciousness. I suspect the reason why every human being is conscious and no human being is able to learn something without being conscious and is not producing complex behavior without being conscious is not so much because consciousness is super unique to humans and uh, evolved at the pinnacle of evolution and got bestowed on us and us alone. We do not become conscious after the PhD. We become conscious before we can drag a finger. So I suspect that uh, consciousness itself is an aspect or um, depending on how you define the term consciousness, the core of uh, a meta-learning algorithm that uh, is allows the self-organization of information processing systems in nature. And it's a pretty radical notion. It's a conjecture at this point. I don't know whether that's true. But uh, this idea that you have is in a function that perceives itself in the act of perceiving it's not conceptual. It's at uh, it's not cognitive. It's a precognitive level at the perceptual level where you notice that you're noticing, but you don't have a concept of notion yet. And uh, out, uh, from this simple uh, loop that keeps itself stable and um, is controlling itself to remain stable and uh, remain observer, where the observer is constituting itself an observer, you build all the other functionality in your mind. You start imposing a general language on your substrate, a protocol that is distributing rewards so neurons become trainable and learn to speak the same language, behave in the same way, that every part of the mind is able to talk to all the other parts of the mind. And you can impose an organization that removes inconsistencies. This is uh, probably that thing that is um, one of the big differences between how biological systems learn and um, control the world and how artificial engineered systems do it. Yeah, I, I, I agree entirely. I, again, you've, you've brought so many f bright and, uh, and interesting ideas, it's difficult to know what to, to uh, um, comment upon. Um, uh, uh, just one thing which you said, um, you know, when, when I pressed you on what is good, uh, you you basically said to survive. So I, I think that brings us again back to this notion of mortality being at the end of the day, uh, the possibility of eluding mortality being part yes, but not of... but to survive as an individual, right? Human beings are built in such a way that we have to be mortal. We are not designs that can adapt to changing circumstances. If the atmosphere changes, if our food supply changes too much, we need to uh, build a different organism. We need to have children that mutate and get selected for these yeah. new circumstances. Yeah. 
Uh, but in principle, intelligent design would be possible. It's just not possible with the present architecture because we, uh, our minds are not complex enough to understand the information processing of the cell well enough to redesign the cell in situ. Yes. And in principle, yeah. that's not something, something that would be impossible. It's just outside of the scope of biological minds so far. Right. Well, um, so individually, we have to be mortal, but it's in principle the cell can be immortal, or there could be systems that go beyond the cell that encompass it, that are a superset of what the cell is doing and what other information processing agents could be doing in nature. Um, that um, basically makes sustainability happen. And I think sustainability uh, yeah. is a better notion in some sense than yes, uh, yes. immortality. So, yeah, I, I, again, I agree entirely. Um, you know, I often look at the the, you know, the physics of self-organization as just a description of those things that have been successful in sustaining themselves. Um, and indeed, the free energy principle is just basically what would that look like and how would you write that down? Um, and of course, the three energy theorists would argue that the ultimate, the only objective function is a measure of that sustainability. That is the evidence that you're in your characteristics ascendable states. Uh, so, you know, if properly deployed, um, you should be able to explain all of those, um, aspects of behavior that characterize you and me in terms of self-evidencing or free energy minimization, such as choosing the right partner, such as foraging on the um, the internet, such as enjoying a good read. Um, or, and, I, and I think, so, and, and this is why I want to fully agree with you in terms of that makes that kind of self-sustaining, self-organization um, um, only understandable in relation to some kind of selfhood, and I think, you know, and, I, and I'm using selfhood in this in your the way I think you're using this basic notion of sentience. Um, and what that what would that mean from the point of view of the uh, free energy principle? It would mean basically that you have you have an existential imperative to um, be curious. Um, so if you just read. Um, the the free energy, I call it surprise, because you talked about sort of uh, predictability before. Um, then, um, if I am choosing how to act next, then I am going to choose those actions that minimise my expected surprise or resolve my uncertainty. I'm going to be act as if I'm a curious thing, and I bring that to the table because that is what is not an aspect of any of this um, artificial intelligence that you described before. The machine that can translate from one language to um, another language, the machine that can um, map from some natural text to a beautiful graphic, these are wonderful and beautiful creations, and they are extremely entertaining, but they are not curious. And as such, they do not comply with the free energy principle, which means that they're not sustainable, which means that one has to ask what's going to happen to them. Perhaps we might sustain them uh, in the way that we do good art, um, but from the point of view of you know, that kind, uh, perhaps I shouldn't use the word biomimetic because perhaps that's too loaded, but the, the way of um, sustaining oneself through self-evidencing, I do not think does admit an intelligent design of something that is not in of itself curious as part of its self-organization. So where would you see curiosity as part? Does the FDA have to be curious? Is, is there any aspect of the utility afforded um, by, say, reinforcement learning models or deep RL or Bayesian RL? Does that have curiosity as, under the hood as part of the ob objective function? I really liked how you uh, bring art into this discussion as an example of something that might be similar to an AI system that doesn't know what it's good for and only exists because we sustain it, because it's not self-sustaining. Right? Uh, uh, ChatGPT is not paying its own energy bills. It doesn't really care about them. It's just a system that is completing text at this point. And it might be if you task it with this thing and it figures out the mathematics at some point, but uh, right now it doesn't. And an artist, uh, I sometimes joke it's a system that has fallen in love with the shape of the loss function rather than with what you can achieve. Art is about capturing conscious states because they are intrinsically important. Right? 
is this art or can this be thrown away? It is art. It is important. And uh, in this sense, art uh, is the cuckoo child of life. It's it's not life itself. The artists are elves. The uh, the living organisms are orcs. They only use art for status signaling or for education or for ornamentation. The artist is the one who thinks magic is important. Building palaces in our minds, showing them to each other. That's what we do. Right. And, uh, I'm much more an artist at heart than I am a practical human being that maximizes utility and survival. But, uh, I think I also can see that this is an incomplete perspective. It means that I'm identifying with a part of my mind, with the part of my mind that loves to observe and revel in the aesthetics of what I observe. I also realize that this is useful to society because it's, uh, I'm basically able to hold down a particular corner of the larger uh, hive mind. That is necessary to be done, right? If I was somebody who would only maximize utility, it would be a, a great CEO maybe, but I would not be uh, somebody who is able to tie down different parts of philosophy and uh, see what I can see by combining them or by looking at them through a shared lens. And so it's sometimes okay that we pursue things without fully understanding what they're good for if we are part of a larger system that does that. And our own mind is made out of lots of sub-behaviors that individually do not know what we are about. And only together they complete each other to the point where we become a system that actually understands the purpose of our own existence in the world to some degree. And uh, of course, that also goes across people. Individually, we are incomplete. And the reason why we have relationships to other people is because they complete us. Right? And this incompleteness is that we have individually is not just inadequacy. It's uh, specialization. The more uh, difficulty we have to find uh, our place in the world, the more incomplete we are. But it often also means we have more potential to do something in this area of specialization that we are in. And individually, it might be harder to find that right specialization. But uh, to accept that individual minds are incomplete in, in the way in which they're implemented in biology, I think is an important insight. And this doesn't have to be the case for an AI agent, of course, it, uh, or for a godlike agent that uh, holds down every fort, that is able to uh, look at the world from every angle, that holds all perspectives simultaneously. Carl, did that answer your question about the curiosity of the FDA? Yes, uh, uh, and um, you know, brings in the sort of primacy of the observer. Um, so now I'm intrigued by this notion of being incomplete. Um, do, do you want to unpack that a little bit? Yes. First of all, uh, Kurt, thanks for uh, pointing out that I didn't talk about curiosity. Curiosity ties into this um, problem of exploration versus exploitation. The point of curiosity is to explore the unknown, to resolve uncertainties, to uh, discover uh, possibilities of what could also be and what we could also be doing. And this is in competition to executing on what we already know. And uh, there is, if you are in an unknown environment, it's unclear how much uh, curiosity you should have, or if you're in a partially known environment. And uh, nature seems to be solving this with diversity. So you have agents that are more curious, and you have agents that are less curious. And depending on the current environment and niche, uh, they are going to be adaptive or non-adaptive and being selected for or against. So I, I do think, of course, curiosity is super important. But it's also what kills the cat, right? It's... Uh, Right. The early worm is the one that gets eaten by the bird. And uh, th so curiosity is important. It's a good thing that we are curious. And it's very important that some of us are, uh, are curious and retain this curiosity so we can move and change and adapt. And it's one of the most important properties in a mind that I value, that it's curious and always open to interaction and discovering ways to grow and become something else. But uh, it's risky to be too curious and instead not just exploiting what you already know and act on that and look for the simple solution for your problems. I, I think it's a big problem in science that we drive out curiosity of people. The first step in thinking is curiosity, conjecture, trying things that may not work, and then you contract. And the PhD seems to be a great filter that mm -hmm. drives out the curiosity out of people. And then after that, they're able to only solve problems using given methods, and they can do this to themselves, this violation of a curious mind. But as the existential questions somehow stop after graduation. 
Right? So it seems to be some selection function against thinking that is happening. That right? is largely driving curiosity out of people because they feel they can no longer afford it between grant proposals. And uh, so uh, in a sense, uh, yes, I would uh, like to express how much I cherish curiosity and its importance while pointing at the reason why not everybody is curious all the time and uh, too much of a good thing is also bad. Right. And the incompleteness now. Um, Carl, do you want to go more into this? Uh, let me finish sure, that. Sure, so much here. Bring it, bring it back to incompleteness in a second. Yes. So I, I was just, uh, no, I, again, I love that. Um, and uh, Just a moment, Yosha, would it be possible for you to expand on the early worm gets eaten by the bird because the phrase is that the early bird gets the worm, but that doesn't imply that the early worm gets eaten by the bird because they could have different overlapping schedules, and in fact, it could be the late worm that gets eaten. And there is such a thing as a first-mover advantage. Um, Alta Vista got eaten by Google, because uh, instead of giving people the search results it wanted, it gave them ads. And now Google has discovered that it's much better to be Alta Vista, but Alta Vista got eaten by Google. It was too early. <laughs> Google has now given up on search. It instead believes in just uh, giving you a mixture of ads that rhyme on your search term. And uh, right, so you could say that Alta Vista was the early, uh, early worm. I'm just trying yeah. to do a tap on, on my frustration with Google, but uh, I, I think that very often we find that the earliest attempts to do something cannot survive because the environment is not there yet. The pioneers are usually sacrificial. There is glory in being a pioneer. There is no glory in copying what worked for the pioneer. But uh, there is very little upside in greatness. Understood, Carl. Uh, well, again, um, you know, greatness, yeah, which is not good. Uh, greatness is not good. You, you know, we're coming back to the tumor again. Um, the art of good management, you know, um, this riffing on your focus on art and just thinking, you know, what makes a good CEO? Is he somebody who makes lots of money and is utilitarian? Or is he, does he have the art of good management and considers the objective function, the sustainability of his institution and her institution and all the people that work, work for it? I think there are very different perspectives on what this objective function should be. And uh, uh, I was trying to argue before that it's not, um, it can't be measured in terms of greatness or money or utility. It can only be measured in terms, uh, in terms of sustainability. The, the other thing I like was curiosity. So, Here's my um, um, little take on that. Curiosity killed the cat. I think that is exactly what was being implied by the importance of mortal computation. Uh, and that in a sense, we, we all die as a result of being curious after a sufficient amount of time. And it can be no other way. Um, and, and, you know, I mean that in the sense that, um, in a very technical sense, um, so if you were talking to aficionados and active influence, um, an application of the free energy principle, what they would say is that in acting, in dissolving the exploration exploitation dilemma, um, you have to put curiosity as an essential part of the right objective function that underwrites our decisions and our choices and our actions, simply in the sense that the um, the expected surprise or the um, expected um, um, uh, log evidence or self-information can always be written down as expected information gain uh, and your expected utility or negative cost, which means that the, um, the you know, just the statistics of self organization bake in curiosity in the sense that you will choose those actions that resolve uncertainty you choose those actions that have the greatest uh, information gain so uh, you know curiosity i think is a necessary part of existing there's certainly things that exist in a sustainable sense but my question was um uh, what i wanted to well, I want to know more about the, this intriguing notion that we are incomplete, um, unless considered in the context of other things like us that, that, that constitute our, our lived or at least sensed world. Um, but, but I just wanted to also ask, do, do you see curiosity as being necessary for that, um, kind of consciousness that you were associated with sentience before? Would it be possible to be conscious? 
without being curious, acknowledging there are lots of things that are not curious. You know, viruses, I suspect, are not curious. Um, trees are probably not that curious. They don't plan their um, actions to resolve uncertainty. Um, but there are certain things that are curious, things like you and me. So I'm just wondering whether there is some, um, there are different kinds of things, some of which are more elaborate in terms of the kind of self-evidencing that they um, evince in sustaining themselves um, autopoetically using autocatalytic mechanisms um, and there are other things that are less so um, would that go hand in hand with having the kind of consciousness that you were talking about that entails this self-modeling I think that a good team should also uh, contain curiosity maximizers people that mostly are driven by curiosity. And so you have uh, a voice in your team. Um, and I love being that voice that is uh, driven by finding out what could all, what could be. And uh, you also need people who focus on execution and who are not curious at all. And uh, in this way, I, I think we can be productively incomplete. If you have somebody who is uh, by nature not very curious, but is able to uh accept the value of somebody who is and vice versa uh we can become specialists at being curious or at execution and when we can inform and advise each other uh we can be much better than we could be individually if we would try to do all those things simultaneously and uh, in this sense i believe that uh if you are a state building species uh, you do benefit from this kind of diversity if you're not an individual agent that has to do all the things simultaneously. I don't know how curious trees are. I'm somewhat agnostic with respect to this. I suspect that they also need to reduce uncertainty. And uh, I don't know how smart trees can become. I, uh, when I look at means and motive of individual cells, <clears throat> they can exchange messages to their neighbors, right? They can also make this conditional. Uh, evolution is probably getting them to the point where they can learn. So I don't see a way to stop a large multicellular organism that becomes old enough to become somewhat brain-like. But uh, if it doesn't have neurons, it cannot send information quickly over long distances. So it will take a very long time compared to a brain or nervous system for a tree to become coherent about any observation. It takes so much time to synchronize this information back and forth that the tree would observe locally. And as a result, I would expect that uh, the... Um, mental activities of the tree, if they exist, which I don't know, to play out at such slow time scales that it's very hard for us to observe. And so what does it look like if a tree was sentient? How would it would look different from what we already observe and know? We notice that trees are communicating with other trees, that they sometimes kill plants around them, that they make decisions about that. that we know that there are networks between fungi and trees that uh, seem to be sending information over longer distances in forests. So trees can prepare an immune response to uh, pests that invade the forest from one end while they're sitting on another end. And uh, we observe all this, but we don't really think about the implication. What is the limitation of the sentience of a forest? I don't know what that is. And um, I'm really undecided about it, uh, but uh, I don't see a way to instantly dismiss the idea that trees could be quite curious and could uh, actually... At, at some level, reason about the world, but probably because they're so slow that the individual tree doesn't get much smarter than a mouse because the amount of training data that the tree is able to process in its lifetime at a similar resolution is going to be much lower. They do live a long time. So, sorry, I'm just trying yes. to defend. I, I have, oh, yeah. yes, mm -hmm. I have many friends who, who, who you, you would enjoy talking to about that. And you, you, and you seem very informed in, um, in that sphere. Um, although our ancestors were convinced that trees could think, right? The, uh, fairies are the spirits of trees and they move around in the forest using the internet of the forest that has uh, emerged over um, many generations of plants that uh, have learned to speak a shared protocol. And uh, I think that's a very intriguing idea. We should at least consider it as a hypothesis. No, absolutely. There was a great BBC series um, where they focused on the secret life of plants just by speeding up things 10 or 100 times. Yes. And they look very sentient you know, when you do that. You know, yes, speaking. our ancestors said that one day in fairyland is seven years in human land. Maybe this alludes to this temporal difference. Mm -hmm. So about differences between you all, why don't we linger on consciousness 
And Carl, if you don't mind answering, what is consciousness? Where is consciousness? And why is consciousness? So in other words, where is it? Is it in the brain? Is it in the entire body? Is it an ill-defined question? What is it? Why do we have it? What is its function? And then we'll see where this compares and contrasts with Yosha's thinking. Right. Um, yeah, I, I am not a philosopher. Um, and sometimes the story I will tell depends on who I am talking to. Um, but at its simplest, um, I find it easiest to think of consciousness as a process as opposed to a thing or a state. Um, and specifically a process of computation, if you like, or belief updating. Um, so I normally start thinking about questions um, of the kind you just asked me, but replacing consciousness with evolution. So where is evolution? Um, you know, what is evolution? Why is evolution? Then all of those questions I think are quite easy to answer. Sometimes it's a stupid question. Uh, sometimes um, there's a very clear answer. Um, so, you know, where where is consciousness? Where is evolution? Well, it is in the substrate that um, is evolving. Um, so, you know, where is consciousness? It will be in this, the processes um, that you are, are, are ascribing consciousness. So I would say it, it is actually the computation of the information processing, the belief updating that you get at any level uh, and just, you know, fully... Um, um, Acknowledging Joshua's point that it doesn't have to be neurons. It could be, um, my sealed networks. It could be, um, intracellular communication. It could be, um, it could be electrical filaments. You know, as long as there is a physical instantiation of a process that can be read as a kind of, um, belief updating or processing. Um, if I were allowed to read, um, um, computation, or, you know, as, as, as that kind of process, then that would have, um, that would be, I think, what consciousness, where consciousness would be found. Um, would that be sufficient to ascribe uh, consciousness to me or to something else? I suspect not. I think you'd have to go a little bit further and, I um, um, suspect that Joshua wants to now articulate how much further, but there will be a focus on self-modeling. Um, so it's not just a process of inference. It's actually inference under, um, a kind of model of the world. And I would, you know, I'm quite happy committing to a generative model as formally specified, um, in terms of variational inference, but we can relax that and just say some kind of model of the world that entails a certain aspect of selfhood to it. Um, so that's what I would, I would say. I, I put something else into the mixed mix as well that to be conscious, I suspect in the way that you're talking about, um, means you have to be an agent. And to be an agent means that you have to be able to act. And I would say more than just acting, more than acting, um, say, for example, in the way that plants will act to broadcast information that enables them to mount an immune response to parasites. They have the capacity to plan, uh, and which is, brings us back to the curiosity again, because you know we normally plan in order to resolve uncertainty. We normally plan our day and the way that we um, um, spend our time gathering information, gathering evidence for our models of the world in a way that can only be described as uh, looks as if it is curious. That's why I was so fixated on art and creativity and curiosity that Joshua was, was talking about previously. I think that is um, probably a prerequisite for being conscious in the sense that Joshua would, 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 would mean it. But I don't know, perhaps we should ask, ask, ask him that. May I ask you a clarifying question, Carl, about belief updating? So if consciousness is associated with belief updating, then let's say one is a computer, a classical computer. You get updated in discrete steps, whereas the belief updating that I imagine you're referring to is something more fuzzy or continuous. So does that mean that the consciousness associated with a computer, if a computer could be conscious, is of a different sort? How does that work? I'm not sure. I don't. I don't think there's any. Uh, in the same spirit that we don't want to um, 
overcommit to neurons doing you know doing mind work um um i don't think we need to commit to a continuous or discrete uh, space uh, space time formulation you know again it's that, that that that's an artificial divide between classical physics and quantum uh, quantum information theoretic approaches um so you know i think the deep question is what what um what properties must the computational process in a uh, PC or a computer possess before you could uh, you would be licensed to make the inference that it was conscious and possibly even ascribe self consciousness to to that. And the way that I would articulate that would be that you have to be able to describe everything that is observable about that computing artifact uh, as if or explain it in terms of it acting upon the world in a way that suggests or can be explained that it has a model of itself engaging with that world. Um, and furthermore, I would say that, um, that, that, that model, um, has to involve the consequences of its action, but which is what I meant by being an agent. So it has to have a model that, um, or act as if it has a model, a generative model, that could be a, you know, a minimal self kind of model, but crucially entails the consequences of its own actions, so that it can plan, so that can it can evince curious like like behaviour. So that could be done in silico. It could be done with a sort of clock and you know, you know um, uh, um, and synchronous or asynchronous message passing of a discrete sort, or it could be done in analog. It could be done with photonics. It could be done under neuromorphic architecture. I don't think that really matters. I, I think it's more the nature of the implicit model under the hood that is accounting for its internal machinations, but more um, practically in terms of what I can observe of that computer, its behavior and the way that it goes and gathers information um, or attends to certain things and not attend, doesn't uh, attend to other things. Okay, great, Yosha. If we think about where consciousness is, we might be biased in by our um, propensity to assign identity to everything. And identity does not apply to law-like things. Gravity is not somewhere. Gravity is a law, for instance, or combustion is not anywhere. It's a law. It doesn't mean that it happens everywhere in the same way. It only happens when the conditions for the manifestation of the law uh, are um, implemented. When they're realized in a certain region, then we can observe combustion happening. But combustion simply means that under certain conditions, you will get an exothermic reaction. And uh, gravity means that under certain conditions, you will find that uh, objects attract each other. And consciousness means that if you uh, set up a system in a certain way, you will observe the following phenomena. It, uh, consciousness in this way is software state. It's a representational state. And all software is not a thing. But the word processor that runs on your computer doesn't have an identity that would make it separate or uh, uh, the same as the word processor that runs on another person's computer because it's a law. It says if you put the transistors into this in the state, the following thing is going to happen. So a software engineer is discovering a law, a very, very specific law that is tailored to a particular task and so on, but it's manifested whenever we create the preconditions for that law. And so the software design is about creating the preconditions for the manifestation of a law of uh, text processing, for instance, that allows you to uh, implement such a function in the universe or discover how it is implemented. But it's not because the uh, software engineer builds it into existence and it didn't exist before that. That's not the case, right? It always would work. If you somebody discovers this, byte st uh, this bit string in a random way and it's the same bit string implemented on the same architecture, it would still perform the same function. And in a sense, um, I think that consciousness is uh, not separate and different people. It's itself a, a mechanism, a principle that... Uh, increases coherence in the mind. It's an operator that seems to be increasing coherence. At least that's the way I would look at it or frame it. And uh, as a result, it produces a sense of now, an island of coherence in uh, the potential models that our mind could have. And it, I think it's responsible for this fact that we perceive ourselves being inhabitants of an island of coherence in a chaotic world. This now, this island of nowness. 
And uh, it's probably not the only solution for this thing. I think it's imaginable that there could be a hyper-consciousness that allows you to see multiple possibilities simultaneously rather than just one, as our consciousness does, or that offers us a now that is not three seconds long, but hundreds of years long. In principle, that I think is conceivable. So maybe uh, we will have systems at some point, or maybe we already have them, that have different consciousness-like structures that fulfill a similar role of cre cre uh, islands of coherence or um, interpretable regions of in the space of representations that allow you to act on the universe. But uh, the way it's, it seems to be implemented in myself, it's pretty clearly in the brain, because if I disrupt my brain, my consciousness ceases, whereas if I disrupt my body, it doesn't. This doesn't mean that there are not feedback loops that are bidirectional into my body or even outside of my body that are crucial for some fun functionality that I observe as a content in my consciousness. But uh, if you want to make me unconscious, you need to clobber my brain in some sense, not nothing else. There's no other part of the universe that you can inhibit to make me unconscious, and that leads me to think that the way in which this law-like structure is implemented is uh, right now for the system that is talking to you on my neurons. On my brain, mostly. Okay, any objections there, Carl? No, not at all. I, I, I was just trying to remember, if Mark Soames were here, were here um, he'd tell you exactly um, the size of a really small region in the brainstem. I think it's less than four cubic millimeters. If you were blated, you would immediately lose consciousness like that so you don't it, you know it's a very it's a very very specific part of your neural architecture um that um permits conscious a uh, conscious process but there are it. also very specific parts in my computer that are extremely small that i could obliterate and ablate and yes. i would instantly uh lead to the cessation of all the interesting functions of my computer and there are many of such regions where there are basic crucial bottlenecks that enable a large-scale functionality. In some sense, everything that would disrupt the formation of coherent patterns in my brain is sufficient to inhibit my consciousness. And there are probably many uh, such bottlenecks that provide the vulnerability. So maybe yeah. the claustrum is uh, uh, crucial in providing some clock function that is uh, crucial for uh, the formation of uh, feedback loops in the brain that uh, give rise to the kind of patterns that we need. Maybe there are several other such bottlenecks. This doesn't mean that the functionality is exclusively implemented in this bottleneck. No, I didn't mean to uh, imply that the pineal gland I is... I didn't think is, that you would, the... but I thought it could <laughs> lead to a misunderstanding of the audience. And I, I've heard famous neuroscientists uh, point at such phenomena and say, oh, maybe this is where consciousness happens. It, right. I think this is almost a superstitious belief. It's like saying, oh, there is this particular chip on my computer. If I destroy it, the computer doesn't work anymore. Uh, and maybe this was just a quartz... Uh, or something else uh, rather than the stuff that is providing the interesting functionality. Or, or the lead to the battery, perhaps. Um, yeah. so, so which neuroscientist has said this then? I'm not naming names. <laughs> you emailed me <laughs> afterwards, right? <laughs> so, so, just, to, just to unpack, um, the reason that Mark would identify this is that it is exactly the cells of origin that are broadcast everywhere that do... Uh, uh, induce exactly this coherence you were talking about. These are the ascending modulatory neurotransmitter systems that are responsible for orchestrating that coherence that you were you, that you were talking about. And I think that's very nice because um, you know it also speaks to um, the ability of sort of conscious mimicking like artifacts. Um, that uh, uh, that uh, whose abilities to mimic consciousness uh, like behavior rests upon this modulatory attention like mechanism. And I'm thinking again of attention heads and transformers that play the same kind of role as the um, the selection that these ascending neurotransmitter systems do. So uh, you know, if you find yourself in conversation with Mark Soames, he would argue that the, the feeling of consciousness arises from equipping certain coherent, coordinated interactions that may be regulated by the cerebellum or the claustrum, but it is that regulation that that, that, that actually equips consciousness with, with the, the kind of qualitative feeling that, at least in the way that Mark Soames, uh, uh, Mark Soames addresses. But, I mean, just notice that, um, just 
reviewing what Josh just said there. He's talking about um, consciousness, uh, you know, equipping us with a sense of now and having an explicit um, aspect that could be, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of... Um, not Herschel, but um, uh, well, actually, Jerry Edelman's notion of the remembered present, you know, which could be the cognitive moment, 300 milliseconds, or it could be if I was mm. a tree, three years. Uh, I think it's a lovely notion, but the, the point mm. being, we're talking about processes in time. You know, we're not mm. saying at uh, this instant, I am conscious or consciousness is here. We're talking about a, a process that, that, that by definition has to unfold, um, unfold in time. So, I, I, you know, I think that's an important observation, which sometimes eludes, I think, people debating about state, conscious states and conscious content. Um, you know, not acknowledging that it is a process. Is a process. What was the example that Joshua, Joshua mentioned? Combustion. Yeah, you know, combustion is a process. You know, you, you you can't be in a state of combustion, uh, and you know you could even argue that it's very difficult to localize um, at a, cer a certain level. But the key thing is, it's a process. I have an open question, and maybe you have a reflection on this. When we think about our own consciousness, we cannot know in principle, I think, um, but just by introspection, whether we have multiple consciousness in our own mind, because we can only remember those conscious states that find their way into an integrated protocol that you can access from where you stand. And we know that there are some people which have a multiple personality disorder in which the protocol itself gets splintered. As a result, they don't dream to be just one person. They dream to be alternating, to be different people that usually don't remember each other because they don't have that shared protocol anymore. Now, uh, my own emotion and perception is generated outside of my personal self. My personal self is downstream from them. I am subjected to my perception and emotion. I have involuntary reactions to them. But to produce my percepts and my um, emotion, my mind needs intelligence. Right? It cannot be much more stupid than me. If my emotions would guide me in a way that is consistently more stupid than my reason and my reflection would be, uh, I don't think I would work. So there is an interesting question. Is there a secondary consciousness? Is the part of your mind that generates world model and uh, your self-assessment, your alignment to the world itself conscious? So basically, do you share uh, your brain with a second consciousness that has a, a separate protocol Or is this a non-conscious process that is basically just dumb and doesn't know what it's doing um, in the sense that it would be sentient in a, a way that's similar to my own sentience? What do you think? Kurt, you, you should have a go on that one and then I'll, I can think about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, something I had wondered about 10 years ago or so, and I don't recall the exact argument, was that If it was the case that the graph in our brain, let's say that let's just reduce the neurons down to a graph, that this graph somehow produces consciousness or is the same as consciousness, then if you were to remove one of those nodes, then you would still have a somewhat the same identity. Okay, so then does that mean that we have pretty much an infinite amount of overlapping consciousnesses within our brain? I don't recall the exact argument, but it was similar to this. And then there's something related in philosophy called the binding problem. I'm uncertain what people who study multiple personality disorders have to say about the binding problem. Like, is that the binding problem gone awry? Can I just then pursue that notion of the um, binding in the context of the kind of thing that, uh, or the way I am at the moment? Yeah, I think that's a very compelling notion. Um, uh, From the point of view of generative modeling, so I'm not as uh, answering now as as a philosopher, but as somebody who may be tasked, for example, with building um, an artifact that would have a minimal kind of selfhood. The first thing you have to write down is um, different states of mind, um, so that I can be frightened, I can be embarrassed, I can be. Um, uh, angry, I can uh, be a father, I could be a football player, I could be... So all the different ways that I could be that are now conditioned upon the context in which I uh, find myself. And if that's part of the generative model, that then speaks to two things. That First of all, you have to recognize what state of mind you are in 
and given all the evidence at hand. So, for example, um, if I want to jointly explain the racing heart that I um, my interceptive cues are um, providing me in the interceptive domain with um, a, a stiffness of my muscles that my proprioception is equipping me with, um, then to reconcile that with my uh, visual exoceptive input that I'm in a dark alley um, and mnemonically I've never been here before. All of this sensory evidence might be quite easily explained by the simple hypothesis, I am frightened. And that in turn, uh, generates um, covert or mental actions and possibly even overt autonomic actions and motor actions that uh, provide more evidence for the fact that I am frightened in the sense, in the William James sense, that you know, I'll have cardiac acceleration, I will have a motor response, a muscular response appropriate for a fright and fl or flight uh, fright response. So just to actually be able to generate and recognize emotional kinds of behavior, I would need to have a minimal kind of model that crucially um, um, obliged me now to disambiguate between a, a series of different ways of being. You know, so it's not so much, oh, I am me. That's a great hypothesis. That explains everything. But to make it operationally important, I have to actually... Um, infer uh, I'm me in this kind of state of mind, this situation, or I'm me in this kind of situation, and select the right state of mind to be in. And I think that that really does speak to this sort of notion of um, multiple um, multiple consciousnesses that, you know, uh, Co cohabit your 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 brain or your or your generative model, and again speaks this notion of uh, well, I'm I'm just wondering whether that can be linked to this notion of um, incompleteness in in a broader sense um, that you know I'm constantly seeking for the way in which I complete you in terms of dyadic interactions, which means I have to I have to recognise what kind of person do you expect me to be in this setting. Um, and of course, I can only do that if I actually have an internal model that is um, about me. It's a model that actually have this attribute of selfhood, but specifically selfhood uh, appropriate to this context or this person or this situation. Does that make sense? Yeah, I have a question about that. You said that you have different identities that you then select from to see which one's most appropriate for the circumstance, like a hypothesis. And is it the case then that you would say that there are multiple consciousnesses inside your brain, or is it more like you have multiple potential consciousnesses, and then as soon as you select one, that makes it actual? I don't know that. Uh, <laughs> I would imagine that you'd have to have another deeper layer of your generative model that then recognizes um, the selection process. And indeed, you know, this may sound fanciful, but there are um, naturalized in uh, in terms of um, inference schemes models of consciousness that actually do invoke um and i'm thinking here of the work of people like uh lars sanstanset smith um um who the, the explicitly have have three levels um and each level uh, a deep gentle model very much like a sort of you know deep neural network and the role of each level is to provide the right um, attention heads or biasing or precision uh, or contextualization for the processing that goes on below. Um, so it may well be that to get the kind of self-awareness, if I now read awareness as deploying mental action in the service of setting the precision or the gating um, of various um, communications or processing lower down in the model, it may well be that you need you 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 do need an other layer of sophistication or depth to your generative models that I suspect trees don't have, but but certainly uh, you have. Um, or I can infer that you have, um, given I'm assuming that, that that I have a similar conception of uh, of consciousness. But I I don't I, I'm not sure that really speaks to the to your question or the one that Joshua was Joshua was was posing that um, you know um, the, the unitary aspect of consciousness um, and you know. Uh, 
does that transcend um, a an inference that would simply be um, biophysically instantiated in exactly the same way that I can register uh, visual motion in motion sensitive area V five in my posterior cortex? I, I'm, I don't know about that. I'll I'll pass back to Joshua on that one. Uh, again, we need a very narrow definition, the very tight definition of consciousness to answer this question in a meaningful way. Uh, if we uh, see consciousness as something that we vaguely gesture at, and there could be multiple things in our understanding, and, and the, it becomes almost impossible to say something meaningful about this. So, for instance, it could is conceivable that consciousness would be implemented by a small uh, set of circuits in the brain. And that uh, all the different contents that uh, can experience themselves as consciousness are repurposing this uh, shared functionality. In the same way as we probably have only one language center, and this one language center can be used to articulate uh, ideas from many parts of our mind using different sub-agents that basically interface with this. You can also clearly have multiple selves interacting on your mind. Uh, your personal self is one possible self that you can have that represents you as a person. But there are some people which have God talking to them on their own mind. And I think what happens there is people implement a self that is existing or in self-identifying as existing across minds. Something that is not a model of the interests of the individual person, but a model of a collective agent that is implemented using the actions of the individual people. But of course, this collective mind that uh, assumes the voice of God and talks to you in your own mind so you can perceive it is still implemented on your own mind and uses your circuitry. It's just that your circuitry is not yours. Your brain doesn't belong to yourself. Yourself is a creation of your own mind that symbolizes this person. People who don't uh, say that God doesn't exist uh, forget that often that they themselves, themselves don't really exist in physics. This, this thing that they experienced as perceiving, as a interacting with the world is a, a dream. It's a dream of what it would be like if you were a person that existed. It's virtual, right? So you can also dream uh, being a god, and uh, this god might be so tightly implemented on your mind that it's able to use your language center, and you hear its voice talking to you. But it's not more or less real than you hearing your own voice talking to you in your mind, right? It's just an implementation of a representation of agency in your mind. One crucial difference to the way in which most AI systems are implemented right now and the way in which agency is implemented on our minds is that uh, we usually write functions in AI that perform something like 100 steps in a neural network, for instance, and then gives a result that makes a programmer happy. And this is it. And uh, the time series predictions of our own mind are dynamic. They're not meant to solve a particular function, but they're meant to track reality. So in a sense, our brain is more like a very complex resonator that tries to go into resonance with the world. So it creates a harmonic pattern that continuously tracks your sensory data with the minimal amount of effort. And uh, this perspective is very different. It really means your you uh, perception of the world cannot afford to deviate too much in uh, its dynamics from the dynamics that you observe yes, in your sensory apparatus, because otherwise future predictions become harder. You get out of sync. You always try to stay in sync with the world. And this thing that you stay in sync is really crucial for uh, the way in which we experience ourselves with the world. As part of staying in sync, we discover our own self is the missing link between volition and the outcomes of our action. Right, our body would not be discoverable to us and is not immediately given to us if we wouldn't have this loop that ties us into the outer universe and into the stuff that we cannot control directly. And uh, for me, this question relates to, ha do we have only one consciousness? It occurs to me that we would not know if we have multiple ones, um, if they don't share memories. Right? If, uh, if I were to set up an AI architecture where a part of the AI architecture is a model of an agent in the world. Another part of the AI architecture is a model of the infrastructure that I need to maintain to make a model of the world and such an agent in the world. I would not tell the agent how this infrastructure works because the agent might use that knowledge to game the architecture and get a better outcome for itself, not the organism. Right? Imagine you could game your perception so you're always happy, no matter how much you're failing in the world. From the perspective of the larger architecture, that's not desirable. 
So uh, it would probably remain hidden from you how you are implemented. And to me, the question is uh, is interesting. How sentient is this part of you that is not yourself? Does it actually know what it is in real time? I think that's a very interesting and tempting philosophical question. And also a practical one. Maybe there's a neuroscientific experiment that would figure out if you have two clusters of uh, conscious experience. I don't know, wouldn't know how to measure this. Uh, but um, right, maybe uh, the IIT and global workspace theory and, uh, and so on are wrong, more interesting ways than we currently think they are. <laughs> Because they assume that there is just one consciousness. Of course, from the perspective of one consciousness, there is only one. Because consciousness is in some sense by definition what's unified. But if there are multiple clusters of unification that exist quite simultaneously, they wouldn't know each other directly. They could maybe observe each other, but maybe not in both directions. Sorry, when you say consciousness is by definition one, is that akin to how you say software is one software as such, but specific no. instantiations of no, software? No, in a functional way. So basically, it's more, more like the universe is by definition only one. Right, you can have multiple universes, but this means that you redefine universe in a particular way. Normally, universe is used in the way of everything that feeds back information into a unified way, into a unified thing. We accept that parts of the universe get lost if they go outside of, of the distance where they can feed information back into you, but they're still in the way in which we think about the universe, part of the universe. The universe is everything that exists. And consciousness is everything that you can be conscious of in this sense. Right. So if there is stuff in you that you're not conscious of, it doesn't mean that it's not conscious. It would just be a separate consciousness, possibly. It could also be that it's not a consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so what I don't know is, is a brain structured in such a way that can maintain only one consciousness at a time? Or could there be multiple, uh, full on consciousnesses that just don't, uh, where we don't know about the other one? I perceive my consciousness as, um, being focused on this content that is my personal self. I can have conscious states in which I'm not a personal self. For instance, I can dream at night that there's that stuff happening and I'm conscious of that stuff happening, but there is no I. There is no personal self. There's just this reflexive attention that is interacting uh, with the perceptual world. In that state, I would say uh, I can clearly show that consciousness can exist without a personal self and the personal self is just a content. But uh, it doesn't answer the question, are there multiple consciousnesses? interacting on my brain, one that is maintaining my reward system and motivational system and my perception and one that is maintaining my personal self. Carl, now that we've spoken about the unity of consciousness, dissociation, as well as even voices of God and God, him or herself or itself, what does your background in schizophrenia, your perspective from there have to say? Yeah, well, that, that's a brilliant question and a leading question. It's what I wanted to, to, to comment on. Um, so again, so many things have been, uh, have been, um, unearthed here, you know, from the basic that, you know, all our, um, beliefs are fantasies, the, 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 um, um, hypotheses, illusions, um, that are entrained by, the sensorium to, you know, to, um, in a way that maintains some kind of synchrony between the, the, the inside and the outside. I think that's quite a fundamental thing, which we haven't spoken about very much, but I just want to fully endorse. And of course, that entrainment, um, sometimes referred to, I think, as, you know, entrained hallucination, perception being, uh, you know, hallucination that's just been entrained by, um, sparse data. But the, uh, the data themselves being actively sampled. So this, this loop that, uh, Yosha was, was referring to, I think is absolutely crucial aspect of, um, um, the, the whole sense making and, um, indeed sense making as a self, as a cause of my own or the author of my own sensations in, a, in an active sensing or active influence. I think that's absolutely crucial. Um, the, the question about are the multiple consciousness, I should just, um, before addressing the, uh, 
about the psychiatric perspective. Um, there is, I have a group of colleagues, including people like Maxwell Ramstead and Chris Fields, um, and particularly Chris Fields, who takes a quantum information theory view of this and, and brings to the table the notion of an irreducible Markov blanket in a computing graph that crucially has some unique properties that means that it can only know of itself by acting on the outside or which you know other parts of the brain um and again acting in this instance just means um setting the attention or the coordination or contextualizing message passing elsewhere but the interesting notion um which is not unrelated to the pineal gland or mark Soames's ascending um neurotransmitter systems that might do this kind of action um, is that there could be more than one minimal uh, or irreducible Markov blanket that practically you can actually um, experimentally uh, define in principle by looking at the connectivity uh, of any kind. Um, but certainly if you, were, if you have uh, a you know, sufficiently detailed connectome, you can actually define the Markov blankets in terms of the directed connections offered by external processes. And in principle, you should apply um, sort of a, a kind of integrated information theory, but slightly nuanced, I think, in this instance, um, to actually identify candidates for irreducible Markov blankets that could be the thing that looks at the thing that's doing the thing that's, you know, that may have different kinds of uh, experiences. You know, there could be a, um, you know, a, a, an irreducible Markov blanket in, in, um, in say the globus pallidus that might be that might be making sense of and acting upon um the machinery that underwrites our, our motor behavior and our plans and our choices as opposed to something in the occipital lobe that might be more to do with perception so i'm just saying that you know i don't think it's a silly question to ask you know can we empirically identify candidates in computing architectures that would have the right kind of um uh attributes that would be necessary to you know to 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 to, to ascribe them some minimal kind of, of of consciousness but let me return to this uh key question about schizophrenia because as joshua was, was talking it it did strike me yes that's exactly what goes wrong in schizophrenia you know attribution of agency Delusions of control, hearing, you know, hearing voice. Again, coming back to this notion that, you know, um, uh, this action perception loop, this, this circular, um, uh, coupling to, to the world that rests upon action that has an agent and that consciousness, um, uh, understood as self modeling is all about ascribing the right agency to the outcomes of action i think is is a really important notion here and it can go horribly wrong you know you know we spend the first you know years of our lives just working out i cause that and you cause that and working out what i can cause and what and what, what i can't cause and what mum causes and what other people cause um imagine that you, you lost that capacity. Imagine that, you know, when you spoke, and this is Chris Frith's um, notion or expression for auditory hallucinations, for example, you weren't able to recognize that it was you that was the initiation of that speech act, whether it's actually articulated or subvocal. So just not being able to infer selfhood in the sense of ascribing agency to the concept, the sensed consequences of action would be quite devastating. And of course, you, um, you, you can think about reproducing these kinds of states with, um, certain psychomimetic or psychedelic drugs. You know, they really dissolve, um, what we take for granted in terms of a coherent, unitary, um, content of consciousness. You know, if you've ever had the, uh, the synesthesia, um, that can sometimes be introduced uh, or um, induced by psychedelic drugs, you will know what it's like to treasure the fact that um, um, the color is seen and sound is heard. Um, it doesn't have to be like that. Um, you know, it's just that the, if we, as sustained comp uh, inferring processes, self evidencing computing processes that sustain in a coherent way our sense making, it looks as if colors are seen and um, sounds are heard. 
that's how it, that's how we make sense of it. It doesn't have to be like that. And you can experience the converse. You can start to see sounds. You can hear colors. You can have a, a horrible distortions of time perception. A moment can actually f- feel as if you've lusted. You know, so all of these things that we take for granted in terms of our sense making are so fragile that you're given the right either psychopathology or pathophysiology, technically a synaptopathy of the kind you might associate with things like part. Parkinson's disease and schizophrenia, possibly um, um, you know, even neurotic disorders um, of sort of you know, affective or uh, depressive or generalized anxiety disorders can all be understood as basically a disintegration of this of this coherent synthesis and, to use your word, uh, the binding. Um, um, which means that I think the same principles could also be ascribed to consciousness itself. And, you know, I'm not sure, um, I mean, it, for the, so depersonalization, derealization, I think are, are two conditions, which I've never experienced, but my understanding of uh, subjective reports from people who have patients who have experienced these do, I think, really speak to this notion um, that there could be multiple consciousnesses, and and uh, of course one will not be aware of the other, and possibly not even able to infer any agency, even if it was. But also, um, there could be no consciousness. You know, I can, I there are depersonalization syndromes where you still sense, you still perceive, but it's not you. And there are sort of derealization uh, syndromes where you are there, but all your sensorium is unreal. It's not actually there anymore. You're not actually in the world. So you can get these horrible disintegration, um, uh, dissociative, um, well, dissociative is, a, is a, a, a clinical term. You can get these situations where everything we take for granted about the unitary aspect of our experienced world and us as experiencers can so easily be dissolved in, you know, in, the, in these conditions. So I, I take Yosha's questions very, very seriously. It's, uh, and so would people who suffer from these conditions. I would distinguish between uh, consciousness and self more closely than you seem to be doing just now i would say that consciousness coincides with the ability to dream or it is the ability to dream even and in schizophrenia uh, the dream is spinning off from uh, the, uh, the tightly coupled model that allows you to track reality and when we dream at night we are dissociated from our uh, sensorium and uh, the brain is probably also dissociated in many other ways and as a result we get split off from the ability, for instance, to remember who we are, in which city we live in, what our name is, very often in a dream, even if it's a lucid dream where we get some agency over the contents of our dream, we might, might not be able to reconstruct our normal personality and uh, crucial aspects of our own self. And uh, in schizophrenia, I think this happens while we are awake, which means we start to uh, produce mental representations that uh, look real to us, but uh, that have no longer the property that they are predicting what's going to happen next in the world or much later. And uh, this ability to lose predictive power doesn't mean that they are uh, d- now um, more of an illusion than before. There's uh, The normal stuff that has predictive power is still a hallucination. It's still a trance state when you perceive something as real, as long as you perceive it as real. It's only uh, some trans states are useful in the sense that they have predictive power, that they're useful representations, and others are not. And the ability to wake up from this uh, notion that uh, your representations are real is uh, what Michael Taft calls enlightenment. He's a meditation teacher with a pretty rational approach to enlightenment. And basically to him, it's, enlightenment is the state where you recognize all your mental representations as representations and become aware of their representational nature. You basically realize that nothing that you can perceive is real because everything that you can perceive is a representational content. And that's something that is accessible to you uh, via introspection if you build the necessary models for doing that. So when your mind is getting to this model uh, level where you can, can construct a representation of how you're representing things, Uh, then you get some agency of how you are interacting with your representation. But uh, I wouldn't say that somebody who is uh, experiencing um, 
a, a schizophrenic episode and uh, or derealizes or depersonalizes is losing consciousness. They're losing their self. They're losing coherence. They're losing the ability to track reality and the interaction between self and external world and so on. But uh, as long as they experience that happening, they're still conscious. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly in terms of altered states of consciousness, absolutely. Yeah. Do, do you know Thomas Metzinger? Some of the things you've just yeah. said, said there were very reminiscent of you know, his treatment of, um, say, phenomenal opacity and the like. Is, is, is he somebody that you uh, have discussed these things with or subscribed uh, to? We discussed relatively briefly only. We met a few times since I left Germany only, mostly uh, online. And uh, I like Thomas a lot. I, I think that he is uh, one of the few German philosophers worth reading right now. <laughs> But of course, he's limited by being a philosopher, which means he, uh, he is going to the point where uh, uh, before he stops before the point where he would make actually functional models that we could test. Right. So, we've, so we've, he, I think his concepts are sound. He he does observe a lot of interesting things, and I, I guess a lot of it also through introspection. But uh, I think in order to understand consciousness, we actually need to build testable theories. And I suspect even if we cannot construct consciousness as this strange loop, as Hofstadter calls it, from scratch, which I don't know whether we can do that. I'm agnostic with respect to that. We can probably recreate the conditions that lead to the discovery of consciousness in the brain. It means we can initiate the search process that the brain is initiating before it discovers it. I, I was going to make the joke that uh, we've, we've offended physicists, neuroscientists, mm. and, and now philosophers. <laughs> yeah, it's my thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's mostly retaliation because I'm so offended by them. Ah, Maybe I, I shouldn't. Uh, It's basically, I, I, I try to study all these things and I got so little out of it. I found that most of it is just pretense. It's uh, There's so little honest thinking going on about the condition that we are in. Uh, it was very, very frustrating to me. What field do you identify as being a part of, Yosha? Computer scientist? Cognitive um, scientist? Well, I've, I like computer science most because I've discovered as a student that you can publish in computer science uh, at every stage of your career. You can be a first semester student and you can publish in computer science because the criteria of validity are not human criteria. The stuff either works or it doesn't. Your proof either pans out or it doesn't. Whereas the criteria in philosophy are to a much larger degree social criteria. So the more your peers influence uh, the outcome of the review and the even more your peers uh, can deviate from the actual mission of your subject in their social dynamics, uh, the more half of that your field becomes. And so we noticed, for instance, in psychology, we had this big replication crisis. And the replication crisis in psychology was something that was anticipated by a number of psychologists for many, many years that pointed out this curious fact that psychology is, seems to be the only science where you make a prediction at the beginning of your paper and it always comes true in the end. Enormous predictive power. And uh, also pointed at all the ways in which p-hacking was accepted and legal and how poorly the statistical tools were understood. And then we have this replication crisis and uh, 15,000 studies get invalidated more or less or no longer reliable. And somebody uh, pointed this out on, uh, in a beautiful text where they said, essentially what's happening here is that we have uh, an airplane crash and you hear that 15,000 of your loved ones have died and nobody even goes to the trouble to ID them. Because nobody cares, because nothing is changing as a result of these invalidated studies, right? What kind of the building has just toppled? Nobody cares. There's not actually a building. There's just people talking. And uh, when this happens, we have to be brutally honest, I think, as a, as a field. Also, I hear very often that uh, AI has been uh, inspired by neuroscience and learned so much from it. But when I look at the actual algorithms, the last big influence was heavier learning. And the other stuff is just people talking, taking inspiration, taking insights and so on. But it's not actually there is a lot of stuff that you can take out of the formalisms of um, people who studied the brain and directly translate it. I think that uh, even with what Carl is doing is much more imp imp uh, results of information theory and physics that is congruent with information theory because it's thinking about similar phenomena using similar mathematical tools and then expresses it with uh, more Greek letters than the computer scientists used to do. But uh, there is a big overlap in, in this. And uh, so I think the separation between intellectual traditions and fields and disciplines is something that we should probably overcome. We should also probably in an age of AI rethink the way in which we publish and think. 
right? Is the paper actually the contribution that we want to make in the future in the time where you can ask your LLM to generate the paper? It's maybe it's the building block, the knowledge item, the argument that is going to be the major contribution that the scientist or the team has to make, the experiment. And then uh, you have systems that automatically synthesize this into answers to the questions that you have when you want to uh, do something in a particular kind of context. But this will completely change the way in which we evaluate value in the scientific institutions at the moment. And nobody knows what this is going to look like. Imagine we use an LLM to read a scientific paper and we parse out all the sources of the scientific paper from the paper and what the sources are meant to argue for. And then we automatically read all the sources and check whether they actually say that, what the paper is claiming the sources say. And we parse through the entire trees of a discipline in this way until we get to first principles. What are we going to find? Which parts of science will hold up? I think that we might be at the doorstep of uh, a choice between a scientific revolution in which science becomes radically honest and changes the way it works or it which in uh, which it reveals itself as an employment program is fake jobs for people who couldn't find a job in the real economy and uh, basically get away because their peers let them get away with it and i try to be as pointedly as possible and as bleak as possible it's, it uh, so science given its incentives that it's working under and the institutional rot that has set in after decades of postmodernism it's surprisingly good still right there's so many good scientists in all fields that i know but uh i also noticed that many of the disciplines don't ma- seem to be making a lot of progress among the uh, for the questions that we have and uh many fields seem to be stuck and this doesn't seem to be just because all the low-hanging fru- uh, fruits are wrapped. But I think it's also because the way in which scientific institutions works have changed. The notion of peer review probably didn't exist very much before the 1970s. This idea that you get truth by looking at a peer-reviewed study rather than asking a person who is able to read and write such studies. That is new. That is something that didn't exist for Einstein. And so uh, I don't know if this means that Einstein is in, was an unscientific mind that was uh, only successful because he was working at the beginning of a discipline, or it was because he was thinking in a completely different paradigm. But uh, no matter what, I think that AI is going uh, to have the potential to change the paradigm massively. And uh, I don't know which way, but I can't wait. So now that we're talking about computer scientists... What do you make of the debacle at OpenAI? Both Carl and Yosha, I'll direct it to you, Yosha, first. Um, there's relatively little I can say because I don't actually know what the reason was for um, the decision of the board uh, to fire the CEO. Firing the CEO is one of the very few moves be- beyond providing advice that the board can make. I thought if the board makes such a decision in a company in which many of the core employees have been hired by the CEO and have been working very closely and happily with the CEO, uh, they will need to have a very solid case. And there needs to be a lot of deliberation among core engineers and uh, players in the company before such a decision is being made. Apparently, that has not been the case. I have difficulty to understand why people behaved in the way in which they did. The outcome is that open AI is more unified than ever. It's a, uh, basically 95% agreement about uh, employees that they are going to leave the company if uh, it doesn't reinstate the CEO. It's almost mm-hmm. unheard of. This is like an Eastern European communist dictatorship with fake elections. But it was not fake. It was basically people getting uh, together overnight and uh, getting signatures for a decision that gravely impacts their professional careers. Many of them are on visa that depend on continuous employment uh, within the company, so they enter actual risks for a time. And uh, I also suspect that a lot of the discussions that happened were bluffs, right, when the board uh, said, yes, they want to reinstate them, but then waffled and came out uh, with Ms. Scheer, who is a pretty good person, but it's not clear why the Twitch CEO would be the right person to lead OpenAI suddenly. So I don't even know whether the decision was made because there were personal disagreements about communication styles or whether uh, it was about the direction of the company where uh, members of the board felt that uh, AI is going to be developed too quickly and uh, uh, should be uh, slowed down significantly and um, the strategy of uh, Sam Altman to run ChatGPT at a loss 
and making up for this by speeding up the development and getting more capital in and thereby basically creating an AGI or bus strategy for the company it might not be the right strategy. Also, the board members uh, don't hold equity in the company. So uh, this is the situation where the outcome of their decision is somewhat divorced from their own material incentives and it is more aligned with their political or ideal uh, uh, ideals that they might have or the goals that they have. And again, I, not all of them are hardcore AI researchers. Some of them are. Uh, I don't really know what the particular discussions have been in there. And of course, I have more intimate speculations and some discussions with people at OpenAI, but I, um, I cannot disclose the speculations, of course. And uh, so at the moment, I can only summarize in some sense what's publicly known and what you can read on Twitter. It's super exciting. It has kept us all awake for a few days. Uh, it's a fascinating drama. Uh, and... Uh, I'm somewhat frustrated by people say, oh my God, this is destroyed trust in open AI if the decisions can be so erratic because open AI should be like a bureaucracy that is not moving in a uh, hundred years. No, this is part of something that is super dynamic and is changing all the time. I, I think that what the board should probably have seen is that the best possible outcome that, that I could have achieved is that open uh, AI is going to split. That, uh, the best possible in the sense of the board trying to fire Sam Altman to change the course of the company. And they would have created one of the largest competitors to open AI. And uh, so basically an anti anti anthropic on the other side of open AI that is focusing more on accelerating AI research. It would have been clear that many of the core team members would join it and it would destroy a lot of the equity that open AI currently possesses. And it would take away large portions of open AI's largest customers, Microsoft. So these are some observations. So Sam is back now. Yes. And, and it was clear that it would happen, right? This uh, move by Satya Nadella to say he works now for Microsoft happened not after negotiating uh, a new organization for a month. It happened after uh, in an afternoon, right? After it was announced that the board now has another candidate that they secretly got uh, talked into taking on this role. Microsoft basically uh, set up as a threat, okay, they're all going to come to us and every open AI person who wants can now join Microsoft in a dedicated autonomous unit with details that are yet to be announced, but they're not going to be materially worse off or research-wise worse off. So this is a backstop that Microsoft had to implement to uh, prevent its stock from tumbling on Monday morning. So Microsoft moved very fast on Sunday and decided we are going to make sure that we are not going to create a situation that is worse for us than it was before. And uh, this creates enormous pressure on uh, OpenAI to basically decide either we are going to be alone without uh, most of the core employees and without our business model, uh, but having succeeded in uh, what the board wants, uh, or uh, we accept the fact that the board has been defeated. And Sam Altman has not been entirely candid with the board when he said last June that the board can just fire him if it disagrees with him. Because that's obviously not the case, because the board at the moment, where there's so much buy-in for the, from the employees and the core investors and uh, customers of OpenAI, they cannot just fire the CEO without very good reason. And Carl, what do you make of it, the whole fiasco? Um. I was just listening with fascination. I, I, I think you have more than enough material to keep <laughs> your, your viewers engaged. Can I just ask that? So, <clears throat> is, is OpenAI going to be ingested by Microsoft or not then? Do you think uh, OpenAI is going to survive by itself? Some people are joking that OpenAI's goals is to make Google obsolete, to replace search by intelligence, and Google is too slow to deliver a product to deal with this impending competition. OpenAI has rapidly growing in the last uh, few months, has um, uh, hired a lot of people who are focusing on product and customer relationships. Uh, the core t uh, research team has been growing much more conservatively. And uh, I think that... Uh, Microsoft was a natural partner for open AI in this regard because Microsoft is able to make large investments and yet uh, is possibly not as agile as Google. The risk that if open AI would partner with Google as a main customer, that uh, Google at some point would just walk away with the core technology and some of the core researchers might be larger than with Microsoft, but they can only speculate there. So the last question for this podcast is, how is it that you all prevent an existential crisis from occurring 
with all of this talk of the self is an illusion or our beliefs, which are so associated with our conception of ourselves, mutable identities and competing contradictory theories of terrifying reality being entertained. Well, Carl. I'm just trying to get underneath the question. Um, the, these, um, the kind of illusions I think we're talking about um, are the stuff of the lived world and the experienced world. And they are not weak or facile or facsimiles of reality. Um, these are the fantastic objects, belief structures that constitute reality. So literally, uh, you know, as I'm sure we've said before, the brain as a purveyor of these fantasies, these illusions is fantastic literally, because he has the capacity to entertain these fantasies. So I don't think um, that I don't think there should be any worry about um, somehow not being accountable to reality. These are fantastic objects that we have created, co-created, you could argue, given some of our conversations, um, um, that, that, that constitute our reality. I think that existential crisis uh, is a good thing. It basically means that you are uh, getting at a point where you have a transition in front of you, where you basically realize that your current model is not working anymore and you need a new one. And uh, the crisis, usually uh, existential crisis doesn't necessarily result in death. It uh, typically results in a transformation into something that is more sustainable and under because it understands itself and its relationship to reality better. The fact that we have existential questions and that we want to have answers for them is a good thing. When I was young, I, I thought I don't want to understand how music actually works because it would remove the magic. But the more I understood how music works, the more appreciative I became of deeper levels of magic. And I think the same is true for our own minds. It's not like when we understand how it works that it loses its magic. It just removes uh, the stupidity of superstition and gives us something th that shows its in its beauty and brilliance and allows us to make it much more sophisticated and intricate. Thank you, Yosha. Thank you, Carl. There's a litany of points for myself, for the audience, for all of us to chew on over the course of the next few days, even maybe even weeks. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kurt, for bringing us together. Carl, I really enjoyed this conversation with you. It was brilliant. Uh, I, I like that you think on your feet that uh, we have this uh, very deep interaction. I uh, found interesting in that we agree on almost everything, right? We might sometimes use different terminology, but we seem to be looking at the same thing from pretty much the same perspective. And I also really enjoyed it. it was it was a very very engaging conversation, and uh, I love the way that you're not frightened to upset people and, and tell, tell things as they are. That's well, I'm not very... looking for a job in academia. <laughs> Good. Well, neither am I. I still don't have your balls. Well done. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. All right. Take care. Brilliant. Thanks very much. By the way, if you would like me to expand on this thesis of multiple overlapping consciousnesses that I had from a few years ago, let me know and I can look through my old notes. All right. That's a heavy note to end on. You should know. Yosha has been on this podcast several times. One solo, another with Ben Gortzo, another with John Verveke, another with Michael Levin, and one more with Donald Hoffman. Whereas Carl Friston has also been on several times, twice solo, another between Carl Friston and Michael Levin, and another with Carl and Anna Lemke. That one's coming up shortly. The links to every podcast mentioned will be in the description, as well as the links to any of the articles or books mentioned, as usual, in every single Theories of Everything podcast are in the description. We take meticulous timestamps and we take meticulous notes. If you'd like to donate, because this channel has had a difficult time monetizing with sponsors, and sponsors are the main bread and butter of YouTube channels, then there are three options. There's Patreon, which is a monthly subscription. It's patreon.com slash kurtjaimungle. Again, links are in the description. There's also PayPal for one-time sums, if you like. It's also a place where you can donate monthly. There's a custom way of doing so. And the amount that goes to the creator, aka me in this case, is greater on PayPal than on Patreon because PayPal takes less of a cut. 
There's also a cryptocurrency if you're more familiar with that, and the links to all of these are in the description. I'll say them aloud in case you're away from the screen. It's tinyurl.com slash lowercase, all of this is lowercase, P-A-Y-P-A-L, so PayPal, but then uppercase toe, T-O-E, uppercase. And then for crypto, it's tidyurl.com slash lowercase C-R-Y-P-T-O, capital T-O-E. I just recommend you look to the description and click there in case you enter in something wrong and there's someone that's trying to fish a different account. Thank you. Thank you for your support. It helps Toe continue to run. It helps pay for the editor who's doing this right now. I and my wife are extremely grateful for your support. We wouldn't be able to do this without you. Thank you. The podcast is now concluded. Thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed or clicked that like button, now would be a great time to do so as each subscribe and like helps YouTube push this content to more people. You should also know that there's a remarkably active Discord and subreddit for Theories of Everything, where people explicate toes, disagree respectfully about theories, and build as a community our own toes. Links to both are in the description. Also, I recently found out that external links count plenty toward the algorithm, which means that when you share on Twitter, on Facebook, on Reddit, etc., it shows YouTube that people are talking about this outside of YouTube, which in turn greatly aids the distribution on YouTube as well. Last but not least, you should know that this podcast is on iTunes, it's on Spotify, it's on every one of the audio platforms. Just type in theories of everything and you'll find it. Often I gain from re-watching lectures and podcasts, and I read that in the comments, hey, Toll listeners also gain from replaying. So how about instead re-listening on those platforms? iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, whichever podcast catcher you use. If you'd like to support more conversations like this, then do consider visiting patreon.com slash Kurt Jimungle and donating with whatever you like. Again, it's support from the sponsors and you that allow me to work on Toe full time. You get early access to ad free audio episodes there as well. For instance, this episode was released a few days earlier. Every dollar helps far more than you think. Either way, your viewership is generosity enough.